Right, this is going to be the next episode of Summary Insight. It's not actually the 201st one. You will notice I'm always very particular with my language, something that's occasionally got me into trouble on this show in the past because people don't care about context. But I did say at the beginning of the episode that that wasn't the 200th episode. I said it was the 200th episode celebration one, and then we brought in a bunch of people. And spoiler, because I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain. In the latter days, one of the things we do now is because we do so many shows. I'll let Monty handle like booking this show. It's why in general, we just do the two person one because we do it earlier now, five European time. And also, we've just sort of moved away from where it has to be like two guests plus ours plus like an, in, half interviewing them. But I was the OG booker back in the day. And if people don't know, this is another one of those things where when morons go, this show would be good without Thorin. It like, wouldn't have any of the guests you're cretin. I book the show and I am the <laughs> fucking goat of esports booking. That's why when we did that episode there, I didn't even get all the big names I could, but I'd set it up. So you were like, oh, interesting. Edward, into N rated. And then at the end, you're all thinking, like, yeah, what's coming next? Like, probably just like some modern cast. And it's just like, bam, LS and local door court at the same time <laughs> on camera. And then let's get into some shit. Let's go deep. So basically, we're back for a guest episode this time for a very special reason even though me and monty could talk at length about lcs all the rest of it we wanted to have an episode where someone who is in theory totally unconnected to the lcs walkout it's not even some i mean technically he's a player agent so in a in an obscure sense there could be a connection there but he's not a team owner anymore obviously rich used to work with h2k and we wanted to also be able to get into this topic and actually have like a, another set of eyes people might have an idea of where we're at on this topic so I think what we do first is this, Monty, just set up maybe, since we did the four horse map, so what's happened with this LCS walkout scenario since then to get us to now? All right, yeah. So, the, you know, this is kind of going to be a multi-parter uh, in conjunction with the last four horsemen, which Phil Aram was on, so you guys can watch that. It is also on this channel um, where he talks, we talk about basically the goals of what the L LCSPA is doing. And now we've we've gotten some updates. So basically, ever since that episode aired, there was the threat of a walkout, which then turned into potentially scab games being played by the LCS teams where they were going to get any players, basically. By the way, it was another instance of the rules mean nothing to Riot, in case that wasn't clear already. The even LCS pretty, that, by the way, I even said as a joke, they could just do it, because he, I think I think he even said on the Force what they're going to do if there's no players, and I said probably just make an emergency sub-rule like they did for Evil Jesus. I even called that in advance, guys. Go on. So, so remember that they made an emergency substitute rule very specifically for Danny and EG's case, which was an abuse of those rules by EG, because it turned out that EG had known the entire time that Danny was basically in a mental health crisis and they pushed him to the brink and at the last minute Riot had to step in and instead of punishing evil geniuses they kind of let them off the hook because they didn't want to uh, have a weakened evil genius like a weakened evil geniuses with a coach as a substitute player at their stadium events so the rules mean nothing to Riot they changed the rules at their will and so they changed the rules once again to say that Oh, no, you don't have to be a top tier player. I think the, the requirement was diamond one uh, to be a, a to be fielded on an LCS roster. No, it could be anybody now. So your iron friend could be on one of these teams. It was clearly because they weren't going to get enough players of a, of that skill level to agree to participate within the LCS um, because there was a lot of pressure, social pressure, obviously, on people. It's a bad look to be a scab. You know, other players might not want to play with you if you have professional career ambitions in the future. So once again, Riot just changes the rules. So what the fuck is the point even of the LCS rulebook, we have to ask, because all rules are apparently discretionary. So now we just can't trust anything that the rulebook says, which, by the way, if I was the LCS PA, I, this is one of the things I would be pushing back on right now, which is that, Riot, the rules are the rules, and you have to follow your rules. Like, otherwise, we can't know what you're going to do. So now, as a result of that attempted walkout, uh, what we have is a situation where Riot has now delayed the LCS by two weeks. And we do have to unpack the language that they use in their announcement, right? Because the other problem with this is that Riot makes typical Riot claims. And what by typical Riot claims, what I mean is they say something, right? And they pretend that that is the only possible uh, it, like this is the only possible outcome when really they are making decisions that can be challenged. So they talk about how basically um, if the, the, the league is delayed any longer, 
So it says delaying beyond the two week window could make it nearly impossible to run a legitimate competition. This is just false. This is false. Guys, LEC doesn't start until the 17th. Okay. So in theory, the two week delay would start on the 15th of June. So clearly there's, if there's enough time for LEC, there's enough time for LCS. Um, and they would, they say they would cancel the entire season. There's also things you could do. You could broadcast three days every week. You could turn every day, every week into a super week, right? Instead of doing the regular schedule. You have even more time, by the way, because the Asian games have delayed worlds into mid-October through mid-November this year. They have actually pushed back the entirety of worlds in order to accommodate Asian games for the Chinese and Korean and Vietnamese teams. So this is just, again, lies from Riot. They absolutely could conduct the summer split in a relatively short time frame. If you did super weeks every single week and you did the two best of one round robins, well then, you could finish the regular season in six weeks, right? So, and then you could do a condensed playoffs. Hey, you know what else you could do? You could change the format. You could actually, you, you know how when we have uh, strikes and walkouts in professional sports, how they just truncate the season? You could do a single round robin. How about that? So there are plenty of options here. And clearly, this is just a, a very hard negotiation tactic from Riot, not actually a reality of it being them being incapable of running the summer split for whatever reason. All right, what are your initial thoughts to that, Rich? Yeah, I mean, to Monty's point, um, something, you know... You were, you were really... away from the mic, by the way. Oh, sorry. Something to <laughs> sort of really uh, smash that point on the head is you could just duplicate the LEC format, which is a superior format, and <laughs> just run that as like a trial yep. run. Like, why not? That would seem like a pretty good idea, wouldn't it? I think that got a more or less universal acclaim when it was... Uh, run in the first two split seasons so yeah i think it is just riot um sort of playing quasi hardball but mainly because they're just being given as i'm sure we'll talk about later everything they could possibly want to be able to play as much hardball as possible. oh yeah so they're under no pressure whatsoever like if i'm riot why the fuck would I seed any ground? I'm getting everything I want and it's just coming in, not in drips, but in droves. So yeah, I, I think to Monty's point, yeah, there's loads of things they could do. Obviously they're lying, but why change their approach? If I'm Riot, I keep going. Why not? Like seriously, <laughs> why not? So yeah, um, I, it's, it, you know, this is such, this whole topic is so weird for me because obviously as any good human with a you know sound moral standing i'm typically very anti-riot uh i'm also typically anti what a lot of the teams do but in this instance i just constantly find myself thinking fuck man i just i'm on their side you know like i feel like i'm on well, team riot i'm on team <laughs> team yeah. team oh, as it were oh, fuck the yeah. players fuck yeah sorry gone <laughs> no, no no i i hear you and it's like that's the problem with this is that there so there's two issues First off, it's disgusting the amount of power Riot has in this situation, right? Like, it's it's egregious. They hold all the cards. There's very little negotiating room against them outside of a labor strike, basically, which is what is happening with the players. Um, and, you know, this level of monopoly and control is ridiculous and, in my opinion, should be illegal. Uh, but at the same time, it's hard not to have sympathy for Riot and the teams because Thorin released a video talking about the economics of the scene and it is it, there's not really a way to interpret the way money has been spent in the league of legends space other than that the biggest winners have been the players and so for them to be doing what they're doing right now is kind of crazy when you think about the sustainability of the league so thorn what were the takeaways from your video um People can go watch it. Obviously, it's very informative, but you actually got a lot of the hard numbers from behind the scenes to, to, to discuss how this has been so good for the players and how this is kind of just economically unsustainable for Riot and the teams. 
I mean, first of all, almost everyone you see appear on a camera or put their name on a byline in League of Legends has fuck all sources. They're all just bozos who may as well have a Pokemon avatar and be hearing from a friend of the manager of G2 who knows someone who's in the fan club of Fnatic. That's literally the level of sources and experts we have in this industry because where was there a single talking head who had anything approaching the numbers I've just revealed? In fact, you were told by the biggest experts in League of Legends, people who worked in orgs, a journalist, Journalists, talent. You were told the opposite. You were told that teams take money, the literal fucking meme that caused franchising to exist, that teams, the big teams take money from Riot. They are given $3 million. No, no, they bought in for 10 or $13 million in exchange for a rev share. The rev share is set in the like fucking player pool, the revenue pool or whatever. But then we were told that they're given money and then they take that and either they keep it because they're greedy or they spend it on other games. As I told you there, all the teams are losing fucking money. Even even the small teams you're thinking of, you know, the ones that just break into playoffs and they have like one match they can win, they're losing money too. So then let's consider like what Monty just said there. The idea of like, oh, but it's Riot are the assholes or is it the team orgs? Wait a minute. So Riot lose money on the LCS. They just agreed essentially with teams because they want Cloud9, Team Liquid, etc., TSM in their league as opposed to leaving or going to LEC. They agreed essentially we'll just stay, we'll subsidize you guys playing. Here is never three million. Philip Hiram. How fucking well has my shit aged now, dickheads? Because it's almost like that guy was a fucking liar. He's at best a liar, at minimum disingenuous, and he is incompetent if you do not consider it to be the former. Because he said himself that he had multiple sources, said that the franchise fee, uh, franchise revenue, 2.2 million is what it's the highest ever. He said he'd heard multiple sources that it was upwards of 3 million. He doesn't even know English. Upwards would mean 3 million onwards. He implied multiple people told him it was 3 million. Now, one, Philip Aram, you worked for Evil Geniuses. You should have access to the numbers when you were there in 2021 or whatever it is. So you would know you never, ever received $3 million. That is absolute garbage. And when I went and checked with the best sources in the industry, the highest is this year, which is 2.2 million. Past years was like 2 million. You could go back. That's why when Travis came out, 1.5 to 3, you may as well have just fucking said it was money. Big pile of money. Like, you don't have any sources. That that means either your source doesn't give you the info or it's not a good source. So the actual amounts were this. Teams get like 2.2 million now, the highest year, each from Riot, from the revenue. And part of that, by the way, is already owed to the players because the players have a cut in the revenue pool. It's just it goes to your team and your team pays the players the salaries. So here are the numbers. There's something like $80 million has been generated since franchising began in 2018 to now. $80 million total. Keep that number in mind. So now, just to clarify, this is the revenue share from, franchi from the franchise of all teams pooled together, correct? Yes, all 10 okay. teams given to them, and obviously teams went in and out. 80 million is how much they've collectively received since franchising began in 2018. They have paid out collectively $170 million just in salaries to coaches and players. Now, is anyone doing quick maths? That doesn't add up. We're already fucked. We're already down 90 million, boys. And wait, just wait. There's more. There's a pair oh, of wait, wait, hold coming. Up. Hold up. So the reason why we know that is that every split, all of the teams are given a spreadsheet that have all of the salaries of all of the teams with it so that they can see. It doesn't break it up by individual player, but you do have an idea of the total value of contracts from each team. So all the teams receive these. I mean, you say we know that. Only I know that. And my sources, apparently, Monty. Never heard another <laughs> one of them motherfuckers in the scene to make a peep about that. Never heard anyone mention down 90 mil just on salaries. So now let's go back a second. And salaries doesn't get it done. You have to house them in LA. You have to pay the franchise fee to even be in the LCS. You have to pay 10 million or 13 million, depending if you're in Legacy Org. So when you added it all up, my sources ran the numbers. And the total numbers is easily over $200 million. Teams are down. Don't, not that, well, then put the 80, I put the 80 in. And it could be as high as like 250 or more million that has been spent to whom? The players and the fucking coaches and then the housing and all the things that go around having players. By the way, did you know that, guys, when you compare them to sports? Do the Lakers pay for fucking LeBron to eat his dinner and his house? Of course they don't, dickhead. They pay him all the millions and he pays for his <laughs> mansion. He pays for the filet mignon. This is, how I, this is why you'll notice I am so hostile to the player position. You have picked the worst time in history. The market where there is 
there's no VC to get. There's no more money to go and get. There's no more revenue from Riot. They're already spending it out the arse and losing. I was told, even bottom teams, this might be the first year when they cut all the costs, they can get losses below a million dollars to run their league team. The worst teams in the league, you know, we all make fun of how long did it after that? They're all fucking losing money too. Everyone's losing money out the arse. So you have this scenario where the only party who inarguably benefits from the LCS, Monty, is, wait for it, the ones pretending they're the Victorian factory worker who needs to seize the means of... Seize the losses, cocksucker. Pull out 200 mil out your pocket and pay everyone seize else. These the L's. Exactly. Because <laughs> the minute thing about this was, to get, we'll get to him in a second, but the reason why I also told Philip Aram to his motherfucking face through a webcam that players don't care about that shit is because players always care about, number one, the Self first and foremost. So in this scenario, right, the reason why I even think Doublelift's brain told him to say the things which we'll get to later is because it's fucking up his paper now. He thought he was just going to make a stand and do one game off, they'd get what they wanted, and then all his mates mash me, you know, all those shitters would be off in fucking academy making that cash again, and he'd just get back on with the split. When he finds out, wait a minute. They, can, they have the IP rights and can just cancel the whole thing. In fact, cause Riot's losing money anyway. It's only the teams that would be fucked. And by the way, that probably won't happen because the teams would sue them over Watch League style. But let's just say that's on the table. I'll even give double if that little olive branch is not as bad as you think, mate. You actually haven't in it as hard as he thought you could because there's more at play. But in that world, it's actually double if has the most to lose there. He loses the millions. Of, by the way, 170 million paid out. Mate, how many fucking millions of that is double if alone? How many millions is Bjergsen? Remember, he's been on the sick contract to like TSM, to Team Liquid, to fly. give me a break, mate. This guy's just rolling in money. I mean, so the actual Bjergsen's people last the money. On, Bjergsen's <laughs> last year on that terrible Team Liquid team was over $2 million. Of course. Just him. So he's getting $2 million, guys, and his team was getting, like, $2 million revenue. How does that check out? You've got zero before you pay for the housing thing. They get his coaches in, give him a boot camp. Like, this is so mental. So to me, the maddest part about all this is, if you want to just talk about the fact of, like, Riot lied to them and misled them, we can do that all day long. We could do that in a second if you want. But this whole thing of, like, the players are mistreated. Having morons. By the way, this was one of the most embarrassing time periods ever to be a general esports fan. To have cretins like Hassan come in and think this is an actual, like, fucking, like, Uruguayan miner dying in a mine <laughs> fighting against an evil robber baron. Or to have all those imbecile people like i am most critical i don't know man shit like the way the i used to play league back and then all that ludwig guy i have heard i used to play league in season three here are my thoughts out my mouth like this is there was no content to be found i tried watching the videos see if they had any info no one had any info everyone's balls or take was like but for, the, there was two balls or takes. One was, fuck Riot. Even though on this one, the joke is, I'm actually on Riot's side. They lose money doing this. Then the other one, my favorite one was, why is no one hating on the teams? As everyone for two weeks hated on every team and told them, ah, we'll ruin your sponsors. If you ever put a scab in, I'll never be your fan again. As the teams are the only ones, inarguably, bleeding out of the arse money every fucking year. <laughs> so well, I don't know. the economics for you, boys? It, for me, you know, I, I, I personally think that the greatest hero in Victorian literature is Dragon. Dracula, the super rich noble who's draining the blood and life force of everyone around him. I, I think that they should give him more victims so he can continue to gain in power because after all, he's the most popular one and the most visible one. So therefore, you know, he's the real hero here and there but weren't any other influencer bloodsuckers coming in to just take him on the <laughs> leaf. Oh, sorry, that wasn't the reference. Oh, the, the analogy was different. <laughs> so what do you think about the economics angle? No, 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 okay. uh, right? So I, you also brought up one really important point that I think it's, it's great for fans to know and be aware of uh, in your video, which is that talent based companies okay so talent-based businesses um including you know any anything that in entertainment uh when you have the nfl or the nhl or a sports league all of these typically operate around 50 percent of revenue to the talent so in sports that would be the players at lfn that's a model that we would that we're like hoping to get to like that's basically our 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 goalpost is like saying that we want 50% of the revenue of this company to go to the talent. Now where does the other 50% go? Well, you have to have a lot of operational expenses. In the LCS's case it would be like production, 
you know, the studio production. Ca I mean, casters probably should be lumped in with the 50% of the talent, but at a team, it might be, well, we have to have this general manager and we have to provide you, you know, X number of services. So for example, for sports teams, they provide a lot of food to the players too, because the players are eating at the facilities, eating at practice, you know, practice facilities, maintenance, um, cost of, of like hard goods. So equipment, right? Um, all of these things, real estate for practice, et cetera. So there's a lot of additional costs that are associated with this. But as you pointed out, Thorne, which was very interesting, was that the lowest, the lowest, I believe you said the lowest cost of players at for in the franchise era was 120% of revenue. The lowest, that was the lowest. So that's still 70% above where you would like to be. And that just shows how unsustainable this thing is. Like there's a few different angles we can go with it. So one thing I'll just say is this. Um, let me think how to explain this. Right, one is there's a take that goes like this. <laughs> See? By the way, this is where I love when you all tell on yourselves and you talk about a field you're not in because when it comes to uh, law, finance, coaching, you'll just watch the TV drama on fucking like Sunday afternoon and go, I could do my own. I could just represent myself in court. Like, and you, you don't know those are written by people who aren't even lawyers or finance people. So, you know, in the courtroom drama where he goes, your honor, I know I shouldn't speak right now, but I must speak to the court. And he goes, okay, go ahead. Like, you know, he just goes, it's not your turn, sir. Like sit down. Like they have all laws there. You don't know how it works. So there's a take that everyone keeps going, which is, this is where it's called cognitive dissonance, rich, where people's brain won't allow them to process what I am telling them. So it skips to, well, what about this? And they don't listen to what I'm saying. So when I tell them the only people losing out of the arse, big time, right, loses a little bit, is the teams. They go, well, then they should just not spend as much or they should have a salary cap. One, salary cap is illegal, you fucking cretin. You are asking them to do illegal things. By the way, there were really famous people who worked in the esports industry saying salary cap. Some even saying they should secretly do it. Go look at what's going on in the Overwatch League because of their soft salary cap that they implemented in exactly that fashion. They are getting fucking wrecked by the government. Then you have this whole thing of like, well, why did they spend the money? Are you fucking kidding me? The same people who for eight years have whined that the NA team spend and still don't do well at Worlds. You want them to not get those players. You don't want Prince to be in FlyQuest. Instead, it should be Sticks here. You don't want Berserker to be on Cloud9. Instead, that should be Sneaky again. That's your solution. You already don't watch the fucking product when they have Berserker and Prince, but they're supposed to spend less and less and less money. And by the way, if you know the minimums, you'd still lose money anyway with these teams. You just wouldn't have any chance at Worlds. You would just go there and you'd get bounced by fucking Rainbow Seven, probably. Like, that's one of the wackest takes of all to me because we can have a bigger discussion about how did the economics get out of control? How did the market become so priced up? What about inflation? What could be done? But that's actually a really complicated topic. It's got so much nuance. It involves things like global economies. Like, for example, you're not not bidding against Team Liquid when you bid for Berserker. You're bidding against anyone in China who wants him. You're bidding against someone from LCK. There might even be LEC teams, as you're seeing now, that have their in going, oh, what's it worth? Now, that's it's not as simple as like, ah, oh, you can have him for this much and I won't bid and then I'll get the next best one and then you get... like The same players will not be in the LCS if we don't spend this money. So that is a massive problem in itself. Anyway, someone else go for a while and I'll come back in. <laughs> that's rich. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've been, I mean, I've been talking on shows with Thorin like sort of six years ago now about how fucked the economics of esports have been, especially obviously on the sure. team side. And we seem to have gone through this like weird sort of game board uh, circle where it's gone from no one believed that, by the way, for it's years. The thing famously, you said it was every, unsustainable. Everyone said that I was lying and it wasn't yep. true and the teams weren't making money. Then they pivoted to, well, I guess some of them aren't, but the really good ones who are run well are making loads of money. And it's, now, now it's gone to, oh, well, okay, those numbers are terrible, but I kind of want what the numbers are bringing me, as Soren suggested, with all the great yeah, players who get to be in the league and so on. And but somehow now like the teams are the enemy again. Like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Like we've come full circle. It's like okay, I now finally believe the thing you've been harking on about for more than half a decade. But I'm still angry about what the teams are doing, even given that incredibly crucial context. So I just think the whole thing is uh, it, again. It, it's the problem is, and this is a, something again that I've peddled for years and years. The community at large, not everyone, but the community at large generally only sees esports 
through the lens of their favorite players and streamers and what they chirp about on their fucking streams. That's it. And everything else, you can, as Thorin said, cognitive dissonance, you can tell them and educate them and get them up to speed as much as you want. It does not matter. If it comes down to cosplayer sneaky unhappy, then it's just bad. Whatever is happening around it is just bad. <laughs> that is still the overriding opinion of the masses. Of course, you're going to find some Redditors with upvoted comments who, you know, speak a modicum of sense, but that is still the basic narrative of the community and that is a big issue and that is why by the way and it, you know again we'll probably talk about it much more in depth one of the most mind-blowing things is that double lift as stupid as he is anyone can say something like in the heat of a live stream right like they get carried away and whoops i actually said my own thoughts instead of what i meant to say that could happen but the idea that you are in an ecosystem where you then edit and upload that as a video to your YouTube channel after the fact <laughs> is mind-blowing. And that can only happen because we exist in the ecosystem I've just outlined. Yes. So that for me is still like, uh, you're all enablers. Like the vast majority of you are just enablers who have allowed this to happen. And to be honest, in my own sort of utopian world where everyone gets judgment passed upon them sort of in order in an assembly line, you fuckers get punished as well because you're part of the problem, like unironically. <laughs> By the way, we'll come to the double stuff a bit later because that needs to be its own comedic thing to raise the fucking levels after we've gone in on everyone. I'll just say <laughs> this. I'm also sick of the gaslighting. You know, I told you on these in the last month or so, I've been going on this tip of like, when people go, of course, they have an irrational hate boner against riots. Like, we have a perfectly rational one based on things that are publicly and privately known and yes. 10 years of experience in interaction with the company, who, by the way, <laughs> is the one who sabotaged and settled an enormous lawsuit for sexual harassment. Nobody was ever fired. Nobody was ever reprimanded. Nothing changed. They just said, stuff changed and you're you're an idiot who because of cognitive dissonance wants to watch league of legends and feel good about yourselves so you watch it and you pretend things changed because they lost money you know it's, my it's, favorite you know, there's a famous saying in law right if the only fit if the only actual price to your actions is to pay money it's essentially a fine it's just rich people are allowed to do that so in the esports community told these told riot games with their actions as long as you pay them off you're allowed to sexually harass women that is what your actions did. So they're the same people then, after 10 years, every time I point out what Riot does, go, why have you got this hate punter? Why have you got this hate punter? I explain why Riot actually is losing money from all this and Riot's actually being strong-armed by players. Well, it can't possibly be Riot that's in the right. I hate them irrationally. Oh, what a lot. Projection, as usual. You're the ones with the hate born against Riot, <laughs> even when they're semi in the right camp. Because here's the thing. I've got the analogy for where I want to take this next. This reminds me of the Carlos and Perks scenario at the end of G2, where what happened was Perks wanted to go to Fnatic, but he made that mistake, didn't he? He had a contract with Carlos. He was not a free agent. If he was a free agent like Caps and Reckless was, you go to Fnatic the next day. But because he signed and Carlos was going to sell him, what happened was this. The fuck-up of Carlos, which people got mad about, was this. He lied, apparently. Apparently, he didn't tell Perks, look, you can go anywhere except Fnatic. He told him, sorry, you can go where you want. And then when he found out it was Fnatic, he was like, no, under no circumstances. Now, people conflated that, Monty, with the idea Carlos has to let Perks go to Fnatic which is an insane concept since Carlos owns the contract of Perks. Like, he is under no circumstances required to sell Perks to Fnatic. In fact, as you will know in off-seasons, he's not even obliged to let Fnatic talk to Perks. Spoiler, how did F F Fnatic know Perks would want to join their team? Suck my dick in a fucking hot tub. <laughs> you know how they did it. We all know how they did it, Sam Matthews, complaining about poaching because you're bad at it, because you're the worst of all time at it. So then let's go back, right? As I'm saying, what the real problem is, people thought what was wrong was Carlos not letting F Perks go to Fnatic. No, what was wrong, if it happened, was lying to Perks and saying, I'll let you go anywhere. Now I'll bring this back because this is a point I know you make, Monty. Now everyone keeps saying this thing, which is the most insane gaslighting Mott and Bailey I've heard in years. It goes like this. No, 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 no. Stop bringing up Academy, Thorin. It's not about Academy. It's about Riot lying to the players and the association. Well, then explain this to me then. If it's only about that, that's called, by the way, Mott and Bailey, where what you do is you have this little castle with like a moat and a little a keep up here and you have this area down here. And what you do is when the enemy breaches the walls, you go and you, you defend it at like the little garrison up front there. And when you lose that, you just retreat into your castle like the Red Keep in Game of Thrones and you hole up there and that's your stronger position. So what you do is you say in this argument, the position, that's a bit frivolous. Then when someone goes, well, that's not true for reason X, you go, what I actually said, and you go back to the most defensible <laughs> position ever, like, oh, they did all this. The reason why you can't go back to that position is this, Monty. 
Did the demands say Riot can't lie to us anymore and they yeah, have to just yeah, come to the table? There was five demands yeah. and none of them were about what, what they're lying at. So, yeah, with, no, I agree. I don't think anyone should lie, but I can't so see that I, that's what this is about. I agree with your characterization of the way that this was handled, but here's the thing. I, I would have handled this differently, obviously. What would you do? Um, what would you, as a speculation, what would you hypothetically do? Well, I, I think you have to. So here's the thing. Now, I, I agree. Here's, here's, the, here's the crazy thing. I think the LCSPA agrees that the challenger scene was terrible and was not working. I mean, I think that is a universally held opinion. If you compare it to EU Masters, if you compare it to um, the, the farm leagues in China and Korea, NACL has been a horrific failure. So something needs to change, right? And so I'm not defending the current challenger system. Like, it doesn't make money, it doesn't have viewers, and it doesn't produce very many professional players. These are all true things. So obviously it wasn't sustainable in any way in its current state. Because if it was doing one of those things, if it was either having a lot of viewers or producing professional players, then it would make sense because either it would be generating money in the former or in the latter, it would be a loss leader to prop up the LCS and, and have native talent development, right? Anyway, so if either... it generated money on its own, people would just take over the team well, without the teams needing yes, to course. do it. Like it would run its yeah. own league, wouldn't it? Of, of course. course. And, yes. and, and the professional teams would also run challenger teams because it'd be a source yeah. of revenue for them, obviously. So clearly something needed to change. And I think that everybody agrees with that. Like double to double lift's point, even in double lift's video, he basically right said the challenger yeah. players were he's overpaid right. and he's right. Um, so I don't think that's really the issue here. And the demands don't have anything to do really with the challenger scene that were issued by the LCSPA, right? I mean, they sort of do in the way that they wanted to create a Valorant style promotion system so that amateur teams would have the chance to play in LCS, which I mean, the Valorant system is better. Like I, I agree that it's better than the, the current model in League of Legends. So I understand that ask. Now, the problem is, is that Regardless of my thoughts on the unsustainability of player salaries, the unsustainability of the NACL, you have to walk out. And the reason is, is because Riot lied to the players. And if they are allowed, just like they randomly change the rules to just lie to the Players Association whenever they want, this is if you're not going to take a stand now, then you you never you're never going to take a stand. Right. You're just. You're just, uh, you know, under the, the boot of riot until the end of time. But for me, what I would have made it about is this. I would have said, riot, you fucking lied to us. And to, to Phil's credit, that is one of the things he was very like. One of the things I really credit Phil with is that he was bold enough to go out there and make that public when everyone else is just a little coward running away from riot's wrath. And so I think that that was bold. But I think that the, the key message here has to be that you need to make a demand about r what Riot says to you, and if they say things in writing to you that they can't go back on them, right? There has to be some sort of recourse or trigger clause um, about Riot doing that. Because at the end of the day, yeah, you may agree that the challenger system sucks and needs an overhaul, but you also can't set a precedent where, where Riot can just arbitrarily change things at their whim and lie to you about those changes up front because who knows what the next thing they're going to do is. They clearly had no qualms about bending to the team's requests and killing, you know, 50 plus jobs of players and coaches overnight. And that's what unacceptable. Do what do you think of this, Rich? Um, I think the problem is, in my opinion, that Monty's making a very principled argument, but one which would never yield any positive result in this scenario. I mean, the problem is essentially that LCS or, well, certainly uh, NA. Uh, I mean, the whole basis of this, right, is they're grouping together LCS with the challenger scene to give it more power, right? Because basically, no one gives a fuck about the challenger scene, like teams included, like the players are the only ones that care. So you're basically banking on the good faith of the other players in the LCS who supposedly are backed by the value of what they produce. But the problem is that's at an all-time low as well. And that's the real problem. It's like yep. what Monty says is correct. But at the same time, again, if I'm Riot, I don't give a fuck. I don't care. You, you, the LCS is nothing to me at this moment in time. Or it's something. But it's nothing that I am willing to like bend the knee and show that floodgates can be opened, that Riot can be broken, that we will yield to, to the demands. I mean, to what the, the points that both of you made earlier, Riot have shown that they're shameless. They can lose a multi-million, a hundred million dollar lawsuit and nothing changes. Like the idea that they're going to tell a lie, get caught in the lie, and therefore off the back of that, 
yield to the demands is never going to happen unless it's something that's truly valuable. Like, let's say it's the LEC and like all the metrics of the LEC are even better, like better than they are now. They're like really skyrocketing. OK, then a walkout has real power, right? Let's say they did some promotional stuff and skin sales or something off the back of that. Like there was an LEC skin and it was the highest selling skin of all time. And then the week later, all the LEC teams are saying we're going to do a walkout. Unless you OK, great. Then maybe you can actually force their hand. The problem is LCS is at an all time low. So, yes, yes. you successfully recruited the people who have have more power than you have but they still have fuck all power in this instance like one thing that riots always simultaneously lied about but also been so, it's sort of a half truth is that they don't make money off esports right it's like of course they do because it's a marketing arm they use it to sell etc but lcs is such a small revenue stream yep. for them right now that really they can cut that marketing arm off right now if they want to and not actually lose anything it will just grow back in the form of more people watching lec or any of the other more successful leagues right so i think that's the biggest problem like again in principle i think monty's completely right and if you're going to do a walkout it should be more on that basis um because again you you have to set a precedence where well you can't keep bending us over and fucking us you can't but they have a complete monopoly they own the ip they can do whatever the fuck they want and the reality is you collectively as teams coupled with riot obviously it's a partnership have not produced something that is interesting enough that uh is is uh, created uh unlosable value like they're willing to lose it and that's the thing and that's why you can never win in my opinion in this scenario because riot is truly willing unlike double lift riot is actually willing yep. to do what they say <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to win. They're going to win that game of chicken every day of the week. And guess yeah, what? And, and look, I, I agree. And But here's here's the thing is that it's not this is the LCS is just the canary in the coal mine, guys. So uh, the LCK, for example, now has the highest average player salary in the world, and they get about a million dollars a year in rev sharing because their revenue is far lower. And so even in a league, to your to your point, Rich, like we can argue that, yeah, the 100K concurrent viewers probably isn't generating anywhere near as many microtransaction sales, right, as, say, the LCK, which has a massive, massive viewership across multiple languages, right? So, but the thing is, is that the LCK is also in trouble. I mean, we've seen some of these publicly reported on numbers about, you know, teams making virtually no revenue being millions and millions and millions of dollars in the red. And the thing about, I, to your point, Rich, I agree. Like, I don't think it's that big of a deal as a, if Riot kills the LCS as a marketing exercise, because I don't actually think in the LCS, they're making that much money off of microtransactions. Like, surely they're making something, but the server's smaller than any of the other major regions. The player base is smaller. The audience is significantly smaller. But for example, in Korea, where, you know, we've had, we've had finals of LCK with, you know, a million plus viewers on the Korean stream. To put that in context, there are 50 million people in Korea, Okay. So it's like 2% of the Korean population. <laughs> like it's, it, you and know, this they is had more English people watching than LCS as well. Yeah. Yeah. They had more English people over the course of the season. Now, we talked about that on a previous yep. show. Now there were a lot more games, right? There were a lot more games, but the total viewed hours was significantly higher for LCK than it was for LCS. So this is to my point though, is that, you know, Riot also is making a lot more money off of Korea because the 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 percentage of players in Korea that watch esports is simply much higher because Korea has always been for the last 25 years very focused on esports. We know that the PC bong numbers. Let me just let me just look at it right now. Um they should still be, be above 40%. Yeah. yeah, in PC bongs. Still one most look. played games by far. League of Legends, 44.65% as of today. Diablo 4, which just came out, is the 10th game at 1.83%. It is also enormously notice, popular. It's the number. Once it, Everyone misses this. They see like CS go, oh, Valorant to number nine. And we're like, if you're not top three in the PC bang list, get fucked. Essentially, top three is like everyone playing. And then the rest, as you see, when you get back to 10, it's like 1% of people. So yeah. League has always led the way in terms of player base. Now, here, yeah, go on. To be fair, Valorant is now at 5%, which is much higher, but Sudden, sudden Attack... Nothing compared to League, though. Yeah. Sudden Attack, which is a crappy old tactical shooter, is higher than Valorant in Korea. So, I mean, you know, it's nothing compared to, to League of Legends, nothing compared to what Overwatch was. Overwatch actually overtook LoL yep. um, right after its release, but now League of Legends has been the number one game for, it says, 253 weeks. I'm looking at a Korean website right now. So, this is all to say that 
you know, a lot the esports is the lifeblood of these games in Korea in a way that it just isn't in the West because the percentage of players that engage in esports is way higher in Korea and China and Asia in general. So the whole point of my my argument here is that, yeah, Rich, I agree with you that canceling LCS probably doesn't do anything, but we are set, setting ourselves up now for kind of a cascading revenue crisis, and they they have been paying the LCK teams less money when we know that the, the it must be nuts the amount of money they're making from microtransactions from professional players using skins in the league and players buying them in Korea. Must be sure, nuts. But then, but then, my, to my point, it's like, okay, but an LCK walkout would be a lot more successful, I'd imagine, on sure. that basis. <laughs> but that, that's the thing. It's like LCS is just, again, I don't want to go overboard, but by comparison, worthless. Like, they're with, they're, they're, and, and uh, to use, again, the Moat and Bailey analogy in a slightly different way, it's like, the moat is NA, and then as soon as there's any kind of resistance whatsoever, ah, fuck that, but then the bastion that you keep is yeah, your yeah, LCKs, yeah. your LVPs, your LECs, the things that actually have value. That's where you're going to set up shop and put your defenses around. So, but, yeah, I think... Rich, I've said it. I've said it a million times. I want LCS to die, okay? Yes. And the reason I want it is just a selfish one, because I don't want to watch it anymore. But also, again, time. with the viewership thing, again, remember that I, I don't know how long they've been tracking or how recently they've been tracking stats, but it was always the case that the vast majority of LCS viewership was European. So actually, you're just redirecting, most likely, that traffic back to just more LC, uh, LEC content. And think about this too, Rich. Like, if all of the great players from NA were to go to Europe, it would increase the talent pool in Europe and actually potentially make a Western team much more competitive in international events. It's not outrageous. Interesting, interesting as that. well. If you had a system yeah. where like top NA players ended up like coming across as a, a, a point of a habit at some point, that might be interesting as well. Like, have a more. Yeah. yeah I don't know. I mean, as I said, I, it's, it's, I struggle to think of reasons why I like, you know, I'll whenever you, you see. But whenever you see something like this happen, I, I, there's nothing I look at and think, oh my God, imagine if we lose that when it comes to LCS or like the challenge. <laughs> like I have, yeah. especially when it comes to the challenger scene, because there's no proof of product with that anyway. It's not like that's produced a legion or like an assembly line of great talent that's gone on to do things internationally. It's produced fuck all. You can probably count on one hand, maybe one and a half hands of players that have come up through that system and done semi-decently. So yeah, I I couldn't. Realistically, I would imagine that the LCS will not disappear, but I am not going to lose any sleep if the challenger scene does. That's for sure. Right. Unlike Philip Aram, I'm not going to laugh about the fact a lot of points were made and then refuse to acknowledge them. I'm actually going to go through them. So I'll rewind all the way. Sure. When Monty was saying about you've got to stop it because if they lie now, they can lie it whenever they want and do whatever they want. So you mean all of League of Legends esports history that we've allowed? <laughs> so we allowed Dom to. They got mad that Dom made fun of a skin, and it happened that the designer was in the room. So they went away, and like Capone, they went get him on his taxes. And they looked through his chat log history. If you actually did that honestly for every pro player, every top pro player, the first five years of League of Legends, <laughs> all banned. But they don't get banned magically. Reginald never banned for that shit. Where how that works? He's telling me he's raging in so Give me a fucking break. So you. I mean, in, in, in Reginald's case, there was no there was no even punishment for years, even at the time that he was a professional player, for literally using homophobic slurs in official TSM videos. Because they didn't even know what happened and they didn't care until I brought it up. That was the only reason it was deleted <laughs> in 2020. So, okay, then you go back. There's one thing they did, stole a year of Dom's career. Then later on, because he made a comment about painting your nails, which is obviously not even meant to be a gendered comment. It's about the idea that you're wasting time and sort of, all right, we in the game. They implied he was a bigot and took core streaming rights away from him. He literally cried on stream because of that, because they took his whole fucking livelihood that he built up away from him for nothing, unfairly. No, Nobody ever cried about him. No one ever walked out for him. No one ever stood up for him. Everyone, as usual, went, shit, well, as long as the lion gets him and I keep running, I'm not, di I'm not tonight's dinner. So then how about this one? Here's why I don't want to hear anyone talk about Riot can lie and do what they want. They had evil geniuses and open secret behind the scenes that this Danny guy was fucking melting down. He was crying his eyes out on camera. They allowed him to get, as far as I'm concerned, an utterly corrupt emergency sob, which magically sobbed in a player better than him at that time and more fitting for the meta. And they almost won against Team Liquid. Go watch that fucking series. It's a disgrace. So they have that whole thing happen, right? Uh, sorry, not Team Liquid, 100 Thieves. <laughs> yep. You have that happened. No one cared about that. Then you had the whole thing where before me and Richard publicized it, that was just going to be a rumor. Then we find out he was abused. All this stuff happened. Did the players walk out? 
players don't give a fuck about Danny, mate. I've even heard players on his team were like, you know what? If he can't handle it, get the fuck out the door. I don't want to play with this guy anymore. He's fucking playing in the game. In fact, they even said, they themselves said to EG, get him out at the beginning of the playoffs. Get a fucking player and he's not going to break down. Like, we want to go to Worlds, motherfucker. We want to win the LCS. So the idea players care, they don't. Then how about this one? This is the most corrupt shit I think has ever happened in esports. Is they had a fucking international land tournament called MSI last year and they let one team that couldn't attend the LAN play from another fucking sovereign country across an ocean (laughs) through internet wires and they won the motherfucker and because that team couldn't attend they made everyone play on artificial ping did the LCK team walk out? Of course they didn't. Did the LCS players (laughs) walk out? Of course they didn't. Riot can do anything they want. The IP rights make them a fucking golden god in the esports space when it comes to League of Legends and everyone in this community has let them do it the whole fucking way with rare exceptions. So here's also, the thing. Oh, go on. Oh, here's another example for you, Thorin. Remember last year when they delay they they basically made it so teams in LCK had to forfeit matches because they had COVID because they didn't want to delay those matches because of the Asian games, an unaffiliated event with Riot, which I said at the time, even the NHL was like, well, we had to skip some games for COVID. So none of you guys get to go to the fucking Olympics. Like, congrats, you're playing more NHL games during this Olympic window instead of playing for their national teams at the Olympics. Well, no, nobody watched walked out of that being forced basically through illness and, uh, you know, force majeure outside of your control. Nah, nobody walked out. You can just forfeit those games. Doesn't matter. So let's bring it back. So now we come to the premise of like, look, I agree with the fact they shouldn't lie. The problem is when you know, and they had to know, as we'll get to with the double lift giveaway of the quiet part out loud, that you never really did want to actually miss games beyond maybe day one for the novelty. And you definitely did not want to go with a nuclear option. Spoiler, don't get into nuclear wars with people mm-hmm. when you don't want to fire your nuclear weapons, you fucking idiot. But there'd be mutual issue destruction, except for it wouldn't be for them because as we're talking about, they lose money. <laughs> so here's the thing. If you don't know why in sports you need player unions to do the battle against the owners. Why, if they have a union guy in sports, do they ever get lockouts? Why do lockouts not end on day one? There's been lockouts in the NBA that went through to the next year, because obviously the season starts like in the autumn and goes through. There's been ones that didn't start until early in the next year. Here's why. Because just like Riot in this case, the owner is a billionaire and the player is a millionaire. So the owner goes, you know what? Not only am I a billionaire, I actually know how to diversify my portfolio. So I have actual passive income. You have millions and you're literally spending it in the club and on women and stupid like Ferraris and stuff. So you know what? When you don't play, this is going to be relevant, you don't get your paycheck in the NBA if you don't play the games. That's why if you get suspended, it's a big deal. So as a result, what they do in the lockout is they say, you know what? I can essentially win a war of attrition. I will wait on my billions and other businesses. And you will take, if you even have your millions, you will wait on your millions. And let's see who runs out first. And if you don't know, there have been famous examples, it happens every time, where players come to the rest of the players and say, we've got to give in, I haven't got any fucking money. There was even one where my favourite player, Kobe, essentially said to them, we've got to give in because I want to win the championship this year and I've got that many more years as a top player. Like, that's what players are like. So already, there was never going to be a world where you could actually play hardball with Riot. Essentially, what you could do is what they tried to do. You could make them look silly. You could maybe put a bit of backlash on the team so that the team's going to Riot. Like, hey, sort this out. Like, we're getting hated on our whole shit sponsorship and fans. And then maybe Riot go... Come back to the negotiating table, but play the LCS. That's the best case scenario, and it hasn't happened. Instead, Riot called your bluff. As you said, Monty, the LCK is the best example. Oh, but what about these idiot team owners in fucking LCS? Spend less money, dickhead. The LCK, Arnold from Gen G, said that they have led LCK revenue for the past three years and never turned a profit. They lose money running their yep. team. And by the way, they're not T1. They're even just Gen G. Like, they're not, they're not even the most famous org. That just shows LCK doesn't work. By the way, as a quick aside, we won't go into it. Do you want to know the reason why there will never be a walkout, Ashley Kang, in the fucking LCK? That's right, homie. You'll never speak on the LCK. So shut the fuck up giving your opinion about what LCS walkout does. You know you would be blacklisted and you have actually turned tail for way less than that. So shut the fuck up if you're not going to actually be honest. As a journalist, you shouldn't even be allowed to win awards if you are not a person 
of integrity. So the reason why the LCK will never have a walkout, Rich, goes like this. Because of Kesper and how the whole system works. Essentially, I can say this. I'm not going to fucking go there. Don't worry about it. The China and Korea effectively as countries run as cartels. That's how the top companies operate there. And they already crush work. Think about where are all the factories that build all the shit in China, but they're an economy that's making billions. In Korea, you can find the greatest possible wealth and skyscrapers and people with like succession level. Like, mm, this is epic shit. And then you have the most barren poverty on the streets and you go back two roads. I always joke, you're going back 50 years at a time. You go five roads deep, you're in like fucking medieval page and there's someone actually cutting the head off a fish on the floor. That is for real what's like there. So in those scenes, by the way, and then as you're saying, in theory, because of the players and the rev rich, they should be the ones that could do the most effective walker. It wouldn't even occur to them to do it. Like they can't even do it. They know in their scene that they're over a barrel. The joke is this really does tie into what America's like. All these bozo players grew up like, hey, I'm in the land of the free, the greatest country. We want, we want a war against the British. You don't know anything about the treaties signed after that, you cretin. Get out of fucking high school. Basically, when you do all that, you actually think, hey, this is like a movie and I can fight the power and win and all the people will rally behind me. Yay! And we'll win like, yeah, the mighty ducks. And what you actually find is you have decided to use the in theory, the threat of your labor denial at the time period when riots losing the most because they're giving the most rev share in exchange for the least viewership and the team orgs are paying not the most because they've cut it down now, but they've paid out of the ass for years. And now you want to come along and say stuff like, despite what Monty said about it just being about lied, no, no, what you have to do is give like free slots to the league and then like promotion and relegation for those teams and then they get to play, right? Here's who would lose, Monty. Let me bring it all the way back. Because by the way, it's not that I hate players or riot for no reason or like or like or for no reason. It's that I know what the team's situation is, hence why I was able to do those numbers. So here's why I don't want the LCS to go away. Because what the fuck was the 200 plus million dollars for? That was not building something there. You had to buy in a slot for $10 million or $13 million. If you bought EG or a team like that, you bought it for like $30 million. And you're just going to go, well, because I don't like the way you're spending your money in a thing you bought into, me, a guy who makes nothing. I think we'll just get rid of the whole league or devalue your slots. Or you know what? Yeah, it's just nothing. You spent all that for nothing. You'll never build in the NFL. It's just over. You all just threw $200 million into a money pit. Good. Lol. Lol. Why is that, why is that funny to people, by the way? That's what made the LCS enter entertaining. That's why, that's why Doublelift isn't retired. That's why Bjergsen tried to move to Team Liquid or Cloud9 and now is an 100 thing. That's why all these things happen. That's why we get to see Prince play instead of you all still not knowing who he is because he's in LCK. That's why Berserker gets to one day probably join fucking T1 or something. All these things are thanks to those teams spending 200 million plus dollars. So at the end of all that, we're going to go, well, because you're not because you're not making the viewership good, which isn't even the fucking team's job for God's sake. That's Riot and the fans that do that because you didn't do some other arbitrary thing you should just have your whole investment thrown into a dustbin and by the way i've alluded to it with overwatch league that would be the quickest fucking lawsuit in the history of mankind you yep. sold me a false bill of goods and then cause fans told you cancel it you just took my slot from me like listen you could take monty's shit <clears throat> and that wasn't actually one franchise and he didn't pay 10 million dollars he'd have had a very good case by the way if he'd paid 10 million dollars and they told him you have to sell tomorrow but he had just the world where you just got a slot and it was up to you how much it was worth and then they could sort of play the play well, we never said to buy it for that. And so that's how they got out of that. So I think, quite frankly, this whole thing's mental. Then I'll add in the time period when you're telling these people to pay more when you can't get VC and the ad market is in the toilet is the time period. Are you ready for this, Rich? Where the slots are worth fuck all now. So even selling isn't a good option. I told this story. CLG paid NRG to take that slot off their hands in exchange for a bit of equity. Not the other way around. You thought, everyone thought NRG bought the slot. Yeah, with equity. CLG basically was saying, we're going to lose so much. Just take part of the money now and take the slot from us, please, and make it look like you bought us. That's why none of the stories since EG and Dig ever say the number. Those journalists with the fucking Pokemon avatar or the massive fucking... Peter Griffin head, like they're living in New York, it's really hard. Yeah, you know, I know about Cuban, but I don't know any of the numbers in the LCS. Those bozos, where'd they never have any of the fucking numbers anymore? Where's the numbers at, homie? I'm getting the numbers like fucking Tony Montana over here. So I think the whole thing's mental. The slots are worth fuck all. It's why, by the way, it's implied when TSM leave, that was a sign of weakness. They said publicly, we're going to leave, even though they have no buyers yet. That was like saying, look, we're for sale. Cheap, must go to the nearest offer. Please, please. And so here's the part no one's thought about. You know what everyone 
goes, well, I blame the teams. Here's why I don't blame the teams. Because the reason why Riot catered to the teams is fucking obvious. The teams are the one funding all of this shit. What are you talking about? The teams are the customer of Riot, not the fan who pays nothing. That's not the customer. The player is definitely not the customer. He is cattle who just makes his whole operation work. And by the way, he's incredibly rich as a result of it and insanely overpaid. So what happens is Riot saw that the only people who make the league exist are the teams, by the way. They saw, oh, wait a minute, we can't lose Cloud9 and Team Liquid and TS. You know what? Right, we'll give you this concession. You don't have to pay that 600, 700k for the academy team. You can get rid of that. And does it allow you to keep operating? Now, here's what happens if Riot says, ha, we're going to play hardball teams. You have to keep academy and that's it. Well, then those teams just sell and leave. And anyone who, this is where cognitive dissonance comes in again, Rich. Anyone who then goes instantly without thinking about what I just said and what the impact would be of not having Cloud9 and TSM and Team Liquid, anyone whose brain goes to, well, then maybe the LCS should die. <laughs> Let me rewind it. This whole thing was about how important it is that people have a community that they can play in and NA and have all these jobs. So now your cognitive dissonance is pure nihilism as a pivot into burn the whole thing down because you didn't get to have your opinion be right on the internet. That is so fucking whack. So to me, I go back to the demands, mate. The demands were fucking ridiculous. And here's a quick thing I want to make a point of. People on Reddit also think business negotiations are like movies. So I saw people unironically up for it to the top of Reddit saying, well, the way negotiation makes is you make as unreasonable a demand as you can. Like you ask for 100% and then they obviously counter by saying zero. Step three, question mark, question mark, question mark. And then at the end of a negotiation, you agree on 50%. No, no, here's how a negotiation goes. I want 100%, right? Well, it's off the table and fuck it. I'm not even going to waste my time with a see you. Here's how a real negotiation works, dickhead, right? I want to get to about 50%. So I go, I'm thinking about 65 if I do these things here. And then they go, well, you know, we really only have like more budget of around 35. So maybe we take some of those things off the table. Oh, okay. Well, what about if I take some of those off? But then I say like, you still give me like 50 if I do this though? I'm like, well, I mean, I could see where that could work. I'm thinking more like 45. And then eventually in an ideal world, like the NFL, you end up like, tell you what, you guys can have 48% and we'll take 52%. And you go, well, that's great. Because before we actually had nothing. Like that's how a negotiation works, but that's not from a movie that wouldn't be a cool fucking movie scene would it that wouldn't be the guy in suits spoiler who breaks the law in like every conversation he ever has in the show and constantly does things like threaten opposing people in a case that you're not allowed to do and then he wins by just bluffing them it's like those cop procedurals where they just fucking trick the guy like well we got your mate and you're one there and then they go like oh well that did it and why is he turned me in they go aha got him on tape and that's entrapment motherfucker that shit doesn't even roll like that so all this stuff is fucking imaginary mate you can bring it all the way back it's like you say, the real topic at hand here is this. The whole LCS was teetering on the edge of a cliff like this, and it needed just a fucking feather to blow by, and it would fall off. And the players fucking... They were like prime fucking Khalil Mack, just body slamming the shit off the cliff. And then they wonder why, as they're all falling, they're all going to die in a death spiral. Because the point <laughs> is, if it wasn't for the fact the teams could sue Riot, I think Riot would cut the LCS. Why the fuck wouldn't you? You just paid for it now. And then on top of that, the players are just mugging you off, treating like a dickhead. I agree. I think lying is wrong. Spoiler, every time someone lies that you like, you go, it's not illegal. It's not illegal. You can lie. So, huh, lol, get on, get played outgamed lol they were playing chess and you were playing checkers like no one has any principles in this industry so to me i can see every person's perspective and the last thing i'll say is this if you all agree as players that the academy didn't make sense anywhere and it was overpaid and overpriced then shut the fuck up saying 50 people lost their job they are not given a human right to play for that money in video games <laughs> the reason why that is so whack is because this is why i won't take this idea of like no no but in the in the keep philip aram believes this philip aram came on that episode said things i know he does not himself believe said things in a way i know that he knows implies something that is not what he thinks and worse than that he basically was was a politician rich he was all things to all men if you want to if, if you have a favorite player in academy well they're going to lose their job overnight by the way what does it matter overnight they lost their job you duff fuck you still don't have rent whether you know a month in advance or not so do you like that's one thing for you what about the angle of you know the teams are greedy and the teams make all this money and then let's go with a riot one you know riot could do x y and z you know that he made every point he could, some of them mutually exclusive, by the way. Like he himself, after saying about all this stuff we need, also dared to say on that episode, maybe LCS should die. 
You're trying to fight for the fucking <laughs> NCL, you cretin. So what he did was disingenuously give you a whole buffet so that every dickhead fan could go, Thorin is really over the top here. He is saying things that don't... Why doesn't he listen to his points? Because I know his points. I even know the numbers better than him, and he was full of less shit. So there you go. We don't have to... If you want, we don't have to get into the demands. I think the demands are so stupid, it's unbelievable. We could get into the demands if you want by, via double lift because he essentially said he disagreed with them. Sure, right? let's do that. Should we do that? Basically, the quick yeah. one is this. Doublelift did a stream, an initial one, where he just said his thoughts of the demands, and then he did a follow-up because basically people said he vented the negotiations. The quick version, before I give my take, and you guys go first, is the demands were stuff like the Valorant-style system. Spoiler, no franchise team wants that. You're just letting people compete with me without paying $10 million. Then you have Riot has to commit to a pool of salaries. Okay, I can see why Riot wants that. What does that have to do with the teams, by the way? How do the teams to blame for Riot not doing that? Just shows how there's no logic here. Then it goes, allow LCS orgs to partner with affiliates for cost sharing. Not a bad idea. Just who the fuck would do it when it loses money and has no viewership? It's a dog shit request. By the way, he was in Evil Geniuses. Why don't you just go back home? You tell you what, Phil, you just get some all this funding that's easy to get. And you go and invest in one of these teams. Oh, yeah, you don't even know who Fish Taco are. You don't even know the teams in the NACL. That's why Dom saw all that shit. And that didn't even have any info from me and realized himself, whoa, something's off here. This guy seems like he's sort of on a grift. He's sort of full of shit then we have this thing where it said they had to guarantee whoever wins the they have whoever wins lcs summer has to have guaranteed minimum contracts for the next year like these are all just like fantasy demands these have nothing to do with academy even by the way you know the joke there is they're all like fucking senators in america the bill is called like the help little poor african kids in academy bill so that if you're against it they're like what you hate little african kids but then in the bill it's like and of course uh more money for uh military spending here and uh, my state gets like a tax break <laughs> like this and you just bang all this shit and they're like what does the minimum contract of an lcs player have to do with the fucking academy guy then the last one said you had to do a three out of five continuity rule for people on the released rosters basically so that like you would get more time in the career you that's the one i didn't understand the most but yeah so what double have essentially said was they disagreed with all of them except for one <laughs> and then he went on to explain that like he didn't really know that the option was to not be able to play summer and obviously the, the gangster one was just take the world slots don't even have a qualifier just no worlds whatsoever uh -huh. and so what happened was double lift essentially explained that he that he didn't make these demands. Some of the players maybe didn't even know the demands. They just believed in Philip Aram, who they talked to. He actually makes it sound for real, like they were just shocked that they got all the players into a Discord. And then they thought, wow, I'm part of history. And then just went along with it and just and gave Philip Aram carte blanche to go and ask for whatever he wanted. And he did all this. And in doing so, Doublelift has revealed he doesn't want to miss Summer Split. He doesn't want to miss Worlds. He actually wants to play in that regard. And so, yeah, there's, there's the initial thing of what Doublelift did. Then when people said, you've in the negotiations then double lift also did another stream where in this one he also said and this is just who double lift is but we'll get to the comedy later he just said like well actually philip aram sent me a message and said like thanks for the video buddy i really appreciate it which double lift <laughs> to be you're the best value. <laughs> oh, awesome yeah i've helped the call i'm helping I, I i'm helping like the fucking dog with the lab coat on or whatever like that from golden retriever so if we get on the back the double lift angles obviously essentially He's the player who's the greatest NA player ever. He's won the most titles, probably been paid the most money. Essentially, he represents the sort of player I was talking about on the Four Horsemen episode and what they really care about. So what do you two think of Doublelift's approach and essentially like sort of getting a real insight into how this happened and what the players think? What do you think, Monty? So I think with with Doublelift, like he's so like he is so close. And Dom tweeted about this where it's like he's so close to getting it, which is that, well, first off, he did to a certain degree, compromise the negotiations. Now, you can make an argument that it's not compromised because the players were never going to fold about literally receiving no money for standing up for challengers and these demands, which is true, because I don't understand why they would potentially lose hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and lose the potential chance to go to Worlds over this particular set of issues. Um, but at the same time, like, you can't just go... It, it, literally, the only power he has is withholding his labor. That's it. That's the only power he's got. So to be to go there and be like, well, the only power I have is this, but I'm definitely not going to do that publicly is obviously compromising the position that they're taking because it's the only position they could possibly have that is worth anything. So I think that's ridiculous. The idea that Phil Aram gives him like a high five behind the scenes, double lift. What the fuck is Phil Aram supposed to do in this situation? He can't undo the thing that you did. So his choice is, antagonize you more maybe have you jump off the the walkout bandwagon or be like 
yeah, that was really helpful. Good job, guy. Like, what? he's obviously not going to be super thrilled that wait, this occurred. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, this might just be the, the sort of British the British guy in me, and maybe I'm giving uh, <laughs> Philip Aram too much credit for having a sense of humor. But if, if what Thorin read out was basically word for word, I assume it was a joke, no? Like, thanks a lot, you little <laughs> well, fucking double dickhead. Double yeah, that's the point. Well, thinks um, it's a fierce value, like, oh, Yeah, that's... yeah, but I, I assume he's like, yes, thanks that fucking human-sized knife you've just launched in my back. I what assume that is what In Britain, that is how people would address yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Go, Thanks yes. very much for that. You really helped the cause. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I hear what you guys are saying. As, as British people, I don't think that was the case here. <laughs> uh, Americans are more direct, and we just don't pick up on that. I mean, the famous thing is, like, you guys say, like, something is quite good, and we think that means it's good, but it means it's shit. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is, I would say, I know what Monty means, I would say it like this. I think it's a bit like what you said about antagonizing him. To me, actually, what Philip Aram was, he probably wasn't being as sarcastic as we think he was, Rich. I think what he was doing was exactly that. It was more like, okay, Doublelift, you've done your video now, let's just leave it there, okay? That's what he was trying <laughs> yep. to say, and then Doublelift goes, oh, brilliant, well, you liked it, so I'll bring another one out, and just went and did more <laughs> shit. And by the way, I, I said it earlier, but the craziest part to me was that Doublelift not only said the quiet part out loud, but holy shit, is it good to be Thorin and Richard Lewis, where you have real sources and you know what you're talking about. Because when you go and watch that Four Horsemen episode now, who was full of shit about what players want and how they would act and who was bang on the money? Because what I said was that, of course, players aren't going to come in and just decide themselves that, yes, do a walkout and like give up all our salaries. Instead, what happened was... They went into a call, even as Doublelift implies, they didn't even think it was going to happen. They thought, I'll just turn up and then probably nothing happens and we all just go home, right? Then they were shocked there were that many people there. They didn't seemingly agree or suggest these demands. They just said sort of like, yeah, go ahead, Phil, fight the cause, mate. And then he went like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll get Riot back for lying. There must be a minimum contract for this. And then you must let small teams in to battle with the... Literally, by the way, think about this, you dumb motherfucking players. You want to allow amateur teams, third party entities to not pay the franchise fee and then they go and compete against your mate in Team Liquid, 100 Thieves, FlyQuest and Cloud9 and then you're going to turn to that owner and go, hey, can I have another $4 million next? Shut the fuck up, you idiot. You actual cretin. So to me, Doublelift gave the whole game away and then that was bad <laughs> enough because he essentially told you how it happened there. But then on top of it, he de as Monty says, he not only said it once, he said two or three times explicitly that he does not want to not be able to play the summer split and yep. not be able to go to Worlds and that if that was the choice he doesn't even think that should be on the table and that he does not <laughs> want to do it by the way he is the LCS this is the biggest name that you must have that's why I agree with you, you can't antagonise him you need him if Bjergsen was still playing you need him too and Doublelift's number one if Doublelift leaves by the way on his own it's over which brings us to another thing we can get to later about the scab thing I could tell you some more info about that because even that was actually interesting behind the scenes but do we have any more thing about the double lift stuff? I mean, you know, double lift is a person, Monty. What do you think about this approach? <laughs> I, I mean, I just think he has no idea what the fuck is going on. Like, he, I, I think he's a very genuine person. Like, there is no subtext to double lift. Like, that's this is what who he is and who he thinks. And he just takes everything at face value. So when Philip Arab gives him this metaphorical high five behind the scenes, like he literally think that thinks that's legitimate. And he doesn't actually use his brain to do any thinking beyond that. And what he did, I think, was very foolish. It was obviously worse than saying nothing at all. He's not obligated to say anything, which is also part of the weirdness of Double Lift, which is like, why do you feel this compulsion to weigh in on this on your stream? And also, how little control does the LCSPA have? Like, shouldn't they have just told the player? I mean, they probably did tell the players if we're being real and he just ignored it. It's implied why based on that thing. You know where it, you saw that Riot wouldn't release the dive because they didn't want to mess up the negotiation. Oh, yeah. And LSPA told the Mikhail Klementov guy who worked at the Washington Post previously that they couldn't do an interview with him or something because basically the negotiations going on. It's implied from that, Monty, that it was essentially like all hands on deck, batting down the hatches, no one say anything, keep quiet and let's get the negotiation. That's implied, right? Yeah. Well, I, I also think, like, in re regards to the dive, like, it was fucking hilarious that Azale put out this tweet being like, ask the hard questions, guys. And surely, mm -hmm. you know, you know, Naz, Naz, the head of uh, global esports for League of Legends is going to answer these questions. By the way, this is the same Naz who 
actually requested with John Needham that Travis redo the interview with them because they didn't like the take previously. And that was an independent media source. So imagine how much editing and bullshit would have come into the dive. And then, like, would it have disrupted negotiations? I don't think so. Like, it just goes to show that Riot, the people Riot needs to do PR fucking suck at PR. You can absolutely go on that show and not ruin negotiations. Especially because it's pre-recorded. It's not even live. It's not a press conference. Like, mm -hmm. come on. You already have redone interviews in the past with independent How bad was it if you even was sitting, you can't release it? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> was this, was yeah, what was it? Like, like, they must have said some <laughs> fucked up shit, man. It was, guys, think about this. It was so bad that they couldn't release it and they also couldn't redo it. I won't lie, Monty. I'll give everyone an olive branch since I've been ranting at people. I'll let you all see a moment of weakness from me. One moment where I got annoyed, I got triggered, which was people unironically, as a compliment, said that my video with all those straight fire financials that no one else in the scene had was probably what was contained in the dive episode that was deleted. That did trigger me. I won't lie. That did actually... If you think Azale even knows any of that shit, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. By the way, I'll just put this out there. If Azale and, and fucking Captain Flowers, or big moral arbiter Captain Flowers... He really hates it when the orgs do fucked up things to the players. Friends with fucking Nicole, of course. Literally, when I brought up that he said nothing about that, loved banging on Carlos all day. Literally just said sort of like, yeah, ha, what about when you blocked me on Twitter? What about when she blocked <laughs> his fucking health, you dickhead? What about when she blocked his fucking career, you asshole? So basically, when these people come out, you know, I would have probably not done the broadcast if they'd have been scabs. Mm, yeah, well, I'll tell you what, you should probably walk out then since they didn't release that episode. Like, that's a violation of your fucking creative input, right? They're, they're just and you're like, shit, you'll never walk out on any of that shit. And spoiler, by the way, I'll just throw this out there for any idiot who doesn't know this. If there's anyone shouldn't walk out at any point in this equation as LCS dies, it's the talent. You are the most replaceable. Sure. Anyone seen Dash recently? No, you haven't. Ten of you go, I watch your stream. No one else does. That's why you haven't heard of him. No one's heard of Dash. No one's heard of Zyrene. Literally, it's the only game in town. And they already were fucking you over a barrel anyway and pay you fuck all. And you're a freelancer. So enjoy paying your own health care. Like, you have no position to ever do this. By the way, I'll bring this back. I'll tell you the reason why I don't support Strike Action, Monty. Because strike action works when you deny your labor, which is what's being exploited. So think logically. You know who'd have to strike? The academy players. But why can't they do that? Because it doesn't generate anything. So they were losing it and they don't have jobs. So what happened is LCS players striked so that academy players come. This is so fucking stupid. It's why when you rewind it, it's not even about the original points. It's basically a power play of like, here's when we thought we could go against Riot. And you saw that worked out. So anyway, here's the thing. There's a world. I'll even say this. I don't think it's as dark as people think. I think there's still a world where Riot says, right, fuck all those demands. But I'll tell you what, for the sake of not having bad PR, because I'll tell you one thing Riot does care about, and it's optics. Just like we did with the women, maybe there is a way we can pay off in this scenario. Either we give a little bit more to the teams and then they get to look like the good guy and give you the like sort of 100, 200K and move some kind of an academy challenger circuit elsewhere. Or maybe Riot does commit to a pool and say, you know what? couple of million make this problem go away maybe they do maybe that happens maybe it doesn't have to be the nuclear option we don't have to either break the players have scabs or have it so that like worlds is cancelled maybe there is a world it still gets resolved i don't think it's the, i don't think it's the end of the world yet well i also to go back to the talent thing i mean i agree with you that they have limited options for negotiation right now because again uh, with the rise of co-streaming, and if I was if I was a caster on the LCS and I was taking a peek a peep over at Valorant and I saw Tarek has like seventy percent of the viewership uh, compared to the regular stream, and there's rising co-streaming now. We've got co-streaming for international events. Uh, I would be very concerned as a member of of the casting talent in League of Legends. Like LEC is basically the last bastion of no co-streaming. And even then the cracks are beginning to show because they're letting Ebai do it. And in, in other, you know, they're letting people do it in other languages now. So when are they going to let them do it in English? Right. And, you know, uh, their value, they're, they're already in a monopolistic system where they cannot negotiate better rates because they have literally nowhere to go because they can't even go to a different league for better money because Riot will just control them. Is it illegal wage fixing? Yes, but nobody's going to do anything about it. And also, I have very little sympathy for the casters because they had years to actually form a union. Years! They could have formed a union many, also, many years ago. 
Are we going to pretend that the scabs playing would not be these casters' wet dream? These fucking NA casters love casting all the bullshit fun events and all-stars and all that shit. They'd love it. They find it hilarious. Look, haha, another throw at an objective. Haha, so funny. He he he. That's what NA is. At. This is would be the epitome I mean, of LCS in a, in a I way, mean, I feel. Look, Rich, all, all you have to know about this, to your point, is that, as I've said many times before, any of these casters could have gone to cast in a better region. Any of them yeah. could have been, they, they would have had the carpet rolled out in front of them to go to Korea and live in Seoul and cast LCK. They could have gone to Europe. They could cast LPL in China. The fact is they don't, but they're like, I stand against this clown fiesta. And it's like, against your whole the region's thing. a clown fiesta. <laughs> I support the current thing, TM. Insert whatever the new thing is. Oh, it's LCK's Walker. Yeah, that too. Hey, that they have to really yeah, that too. I think a lot of the the casters in LCS are really good. And so they could have had, humans, and it, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't even matter uh, that, you know, it, it doesn't even matter. For example, like they could have gone at any point in time because riot prioritizes those casters. How do we know that? Well, they're always in the international finals. This last, this last fucking MSI final, there were literally zero LPL people on either the desk or cast. They had Dagda, but Dagda doesn't cast LPL anymore, right? And so he wasn't as up to date as an LPL caster. So clearly they, they prefer these people, in which case, why wouldn't they prefer them to go to other regions? Like if you ask to do that, you could do that. And the reason for LPL is money. They pay the LP LPL casters not that much money. Uh, for LCK, I don't know what the reason is. I lived in Seoul for five years. It was awesome. Uh, you know, I got paid well. I I, I think uh, the LCK casters get paid equivalently to the LCS casters, except they don't have to live in Los Angeles. So it's a fuck ton cheap, cheaper. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th these are choices that they've made. And like, I just don't get it because they have consistently had their negotiating position weakened and to the point where now they can't do anything and they're watching the viewership go down. And so what are they going to say? Absolutely nothing, because frankly, they've been cowards for the entirety of the existence of the LCS. They've never taken a stand for themselves. I had to take a stand to increase their wages. That's the only reason that they got their pay basically doubled in like 2016 was because I said shit. The only reason that they are able to monetize their streams, because remember, Riot said, oh, you can't have subscribers on your personal streams. You can't have a Twitch partnership was because of me, because I revealed that that was true. And then they let up on that. So I've done more for them than they have done for themselves, which is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I think yeah, I, mean, I think blocked on on Twitter, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> <laughs> I think the I think the, the the bottom line for me, which is something I think obviously we're all saying it with everything that we say, but the bottom line is the way this whole thing is being presented is like Thatcher shutting down the coal mines or something like. Coal, obviously, for those that don't know, being still a useful resource, no matter how gritty or dirty or immoral the process of getting it is. The problem with this academy system is it is entirely worthless. There is no proof of product whatsoever when it comes to actually doing what it is meant to do. It is just a massive cash sink. But they're using all these sort of moralistic arguments. Again, it's like I said this on Science Lake. It's like the guy who wins the, the competition to look after a private island for 100 grand a year. That job does not need yes. to exist. These jobs do not need to exist. They are worthless jobs. And the problem is the demands that the PA is making, they don't actually fix it at all. If you take away take away the relegation point, because that will never happen in a million years, as Thorin already said. It devalues franchise slots. No one's going to yes. co sign that. So that will not happen. So then right. everything and by the way, you read... So I was going to say, everything you read the... after that point is irrelevant because it doesn't fix yeah. anything. It doesn't increase the value. Yeah. It doesn't change anything. So all the demands that you ask, you you say, Philip Aram and all the rest of you, got, you are representing the player's best interest. No, this is some weird little short-term solution until, what, the next time the team's like, hey, guess what? They're still not making money. It still doesn't make sense. And sure, Rob Riot is somewhat subsidizing it, but it's still a waste of everyone's time. You didn't actually provide any fixes or solutions. There was no, even a format change, right? Where you're like, I think this would be more conducive to actually blooding players better, giving them more experience. Maybe the lock-in tournament, or maybe we should br bring that back and mix the two so they can have some experience, but it also doesn't impinge on, you know, the franchise fee. They're not actually an LCS. Like maybe we can have a tournament where people get experience, whatever. They didn't suggest anything that would actually improve the quality of life for these professions as like academy players nothing nothing outside 
of an impossible suggestion of relegation. So I think that is like the biggest thing. And the other just last small point I'll make, this is something that double lift, I think, embodies entirely is the level of entitlement is astronomical. His whole thing of like, ultimately, I don't actually want to set out any games. He this is the epitome of cake and eat it. He wants to be able to strong arm without actually strong arming, but he's so outraged and upset that he might not actually just get everything that he wants. And you can see it in his fucking face. It's not just the words that he's saying. He's like, man, it really sucks if I don't get to play LCS. But at the same time, I do kind of want all these things that we're demanding he to happen. Put them all in all the academy players. <laughs> yeah. anyway, I'll give you a little teaser. I'll probably do a video on this because I'm actually going to do a video the kind only I can do. Where instead of breaking down this topic, because I've given you like a free mini fucking four horsemen episode. Spoiler, this is essentially the three horsemen. It's just, you know what? There wasn't any LCS dickhead. So unlike you guys, we can't walk out. We had to do an episode anyway, <laughs> didn't we? And this particular one could go on ye old Reddit because hasn't got you know who. Fucking Voldemort himself has it. So basically, <laughs> what we're doing on this one is I'll give you a little freebie I'm going to do a video it's not going to be about double lift in the LCS it's going to be about double lift's mind how he thinks and what his actual like dynamic has been with the community because I've known this guy for years I've known behind the scenes the people involved with him I've known his friends his teammates he's another one of those people I've got all the fucking dirt so all I'll say is this Rich I used to fucking love me some double lift when Kelby was the one holding the reins because that guy had his head screwed on he wanted the best for double lift himself he actually cared about esports. He even understood the show and uh, having a competitive team. And even when, by the way, Double F wasn't on his team anymore, still a cool guy who would take care of him, be a friend, steer him in the right direction. I'll even say, by the way, Travis has done a half decent job of that. Behind the scenes, one thing I'll never say bad about Travis is I think he's done good by Double F, not just at the beginning. He's done good since then. He even, the joke is he even himself would help Double F not say stupid stuff in interviews sometimes or protect him from it or go, well, you don't really mean that, of course, do you, Peter? As soon as he says Peter, by the way, instead of Double F, you know already it's like, Ixnay on the Ixnay, like, you know, even he's helped him. My problem is this. I saw another figure who was a bit of a bozo, couldn't really talk, and spoke faster than his brain worked, who also got ruined. Oh, Reggie, that's right. And who was involved with both people? Lady Macbeth herself, <laughs> Lena. And all you need to know, if you don't know the, the story of Macbeth, is Lady Macbeth is pulling the strings behind the scenes all along, wasn't she? But who took the blame for it? Good old Macbeth. So all I thought when I saw this was... Oh, interesting that Lena thinks that. I heard Double of say all these comments. I thought, oh, I'll tell you what I think's happened here. I don't think Double is smart enough to sit around and go, wait a minute, that means that my career's being in. I think what happens is, I think Lena fucking turns that key in his back, just like she did about Reggie with TSM, even though, by the way, the same year he said that would be a year he would have been playing as a starter for TSM if they'd agreed to sign him when he asked to join. But suddenly he hated them and they were abusive and he'd never work with them and they were scum. Then a month earlier, I'd love to work with TSM. Like, he's a fucking idiot. So when I hear him say that, what I think is Lena's gone like, of course, you know, if they really do not do the summer split and they do Worlds, uh, you'll be out on that money, won't you? And at that point, we're just surviving off my salary or your stream. If I, Actually, while you can't play, the only thing you really can do is stream, can't you? And I'll tell you what would be a hot topic that we could get to here, Double If. What if you <laughs> talked about this on your stream now? You'd get, like, all the viewers. What's that? People are flaming you for the video. You're Double If. You have millions of subscribers and viewers. Everyone's going to believe you. Put another video out, my darling. This is the thing. I'll give her credit. Look. She's not intelligent herself, but compared... She's room temperature IQ, don't worry. But compared to Reggie and Dublin, she's a genius. She's like fucking... Kang out of the fucking that's a date reference to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. She's just the brains of the operation. It's, it's actually a reference Captain I make America. all the time as a result uh, when I say <laughs> Trovi is the mech and, and Peanut yeah, yeah, is Kang. <laughs> so I think there's, some, oh, yes. there's one other topic I can actually bring up, which is another area the fans were 100% wrong on. And remember, because you fans already don't watch LCS and pay checks notes, fuck all. You're, you being mad on Reddit, big mad, doesn't affect Riot's bottom line. Are you ready? So the notion was, Monty, well, the reason why they've had to expand out the requirements is because otherwise no player would play. Because remember, this is a human rights issue. And to be just a good, just be a good person, TM. The standard left-wing position in the modern day when you know nothing about the topic. Just be a good person, TM. Right? To be a good person, TM, means every player and fan in the world supports the players and knows this is about the human right to play an academy. So no players will 
were willing to scab for the Monty. So what they had to do was open up the requirements so staff could play and nobody's... Nope, that's wrong. I actually went out there and I found some sources, some people who were arranging scab teams and who were going to be scab players. And here's what I found out. Basically, there were people who were putting together pl players. They knew there were so many people in the scene. There were ex-players who just don't ever plan to be pro again, don't give a shit and we're going to go and play. There were people who were good solo queue players who have no interest in ever being a pro. They were willing to play. There were low-level people who also were willing to play. And even more so, a bunch of like players, I'll just say, even sort of had mates of theirs that were sort of like, look, if they're going to take anybody, you may as well take it. Yeah, even that was going on behind the scenes. And the best part is when some of these people in the ecosystem would say to players and academy players and teams, well, I'm not going to get fucking wrecked. Everyone online saying they hate scabs and will be vilified forever. Most of the messaging was coming back. Like, not really. Like, it'll be bad for a day or two. It'll be bad for a week. Or anyway, what if the deal gets resolved after the first day? What if you play and, the, and then at that point, they won't matter. And basically, the, the actual feeling behind the scenes, it was Riot who cancelled the split. I believe the teams were going to go to the limit and fucking field these players and play the scab games. The notion there was no scab players, nonsense. And the notion that it would have ended the league. Here's the other thing I want to say. I'm almost sad. You know, everyone else laughed. Ha! Imagine how foolish Double have said it would be if you came on, the walkout happens, and it's all scab players. You don't know esports, you dickhead. Here's what would have happened. Remember, the plan of the players, Monty, was on day one, we're not going to play. And on day one, you'll have scab players and it'll ruin your league. You know this with the Overwatch League, bro. Day one would be the highest viewed day of the entire year of LCS. Everyone, including people who say they don't support it, would tune in just to see what was happening. It's Call of Duty boycott all over again. Who the fuck wouldn't? If you don't know why, the Overwatch League on day one had 400k viewers, guys, because everyone was like, I thought this shit's huge, it's going to fail. So everyone tuned in on day one. Then as the weeks went by, the viewership dropped off. So actually, the sad thing is this. Riot saved your asses, pro players. Day one would have had higher viewership than if you played. You know why? I, Dom, let's bring in I Will Dominate and Richard Lewis because you've got a fundamentally shit product, you moron. So in that scenario, day one wouldn't even have worked. Now look, maybe if you kept it going, maybe if you kept it going a week, two weeks, yeah, then it's going to drop off. The novelty's day one. But beyond that, like, I even think that could have failed me. I think if these scab players were allowed to play, it would have happened. And as I'm saying, there are names that would have been on that list that you would get very fucking upset about. It wasn't nobody's. All right, so I, I think as as in regards to the scab players, I didn't really have an issue with you know some of these former players coming back in who have no there. The, the issue with scabs is really like who is there to take someone's job who currently exists, and if they have no interest in coming back, the teams had to field somebody. And like I sympathize, really? with the I mean, teams they had to part of their agreement with Riot, right? As yeah. part of the partnership yep. agreement, they have to field players or they get massively fined. And if they, they, if they miss, they'll take the slot. <laughs> no, if they miss enough yes. games, they literally can have their slot re revoked. So why should the teams be punished for the players' actions? Like that's why Riot opened this up. And that's why I was not going to get mad at any scabs. Like, they, they would have been a bunch of people with no shot at the LCS who have already had their shot, who aren't trying to get back in. Yep. But somebody had to play because otherwise the teams get un... The teams have nothing to do with this problem, guys. They're just being unfairly punished. Like, why should they lose their investment? And to the point earlier about the franchise slot and devaluing it, that's the only value that's left, guys. That's why it can't be devalued. Because they're, they're, these are things that lose money. Currently, so it, you can't devalue the last. It's the one thing the teams fucking have right now is ownership of this slot. It's the one thing they have that's valuable. And even then, as we've seen, team CLG Madison Square Garden is paying to leave. You know, they're giving the slot over for equity and paying NRG to take this slot. Right. And we've seen. These slots are now worth between 20 and 30 million dollars in LCS, which is way less than LEC based on the, the the buyouts that we saw from like misfits that were publicly reported. So what what, is, what other value is there? So you actually just can't capitulate on that because it's the one thing the teams have. So the teams are the ones who are getting fucked the most in all of this. Right. Remember, and everyone was saying we're going to hit on the teams because they're so evil. They're going to field scabs. No, they have their slot taken away from them. The one they paid 10 or 13 million or 30 million dollars for. Why are they the dickheads then? It's Riot that you should be mad at again. That's why I said, look, I'm not totally mad at Riot. I hate the fact they lied. I understand they lose money. But the idea that Riot isn't the only one in the crosshair. Every single time those Reddit threads, if you went and saw them, a top comment was always like, why are we not just hating on the teams? 
By the way, here I said this on the last episode, so I won't do the rant again, Monty. Scroll to the part with Loco and LS, and I make the point that literally you are fucking up the money for those teams for the rest of the year, maybe forever. Like at that point, when the sponsors find out the players don't play, in fact, because we fielded scabs because we had to, now they hate the org that was sponsoring and actively despise the... You are fucked up, not just day one of the LCS. You are fucked up the whole ecosystem at that point. So there's all rant I did on the last episode about that, but that's this is why I everyone can carry a can for something in this regard. Fans, pros, team orgs, game dev, but... One of the one of the things I'd say towards the end, I tried to make this point a million times on the Philip Aaron episode, he just wasn't going to hear it, was there is so much nuance in this scenario. There is no, it's good for everyone. There's good things that are certain interests that counterbalance each other. And more importantly, it's so complicated. There is no one bad guy. This is not an episode of Heroes. There's no big bad. And it's not even Riot in this case. I spent my whole fucking career pointing out corruption of Riot. Although people told me when I said stuff about how they treated women that I was just a hater, irrationally with a hate boner. So the, in this scenario, like I think the, the saddest thing about all this is none of the discussion ever gets us any closer. It's just, right, who do we blame though? Because fans, I must let my vitriol off. I must hate someone directly on Twitter. Like it's just so fucking sick. Like let's actually talk about the real issues. The, by the way, as I tried to do on that episode, the abstracts of, well, how do we get inflation salaries down? And how do we make a league where it's possible for there to be other op These are the things we want to talk about. Not just, it's all right. And team orgs, just pay more, just pay more, bro said the people who pay nothing <laughs> and also i want to bring that up because uh, you know there's been a lot of content obviously made about we we talked about this on before horseman with esports winter well, we talked about it. Right now give us some fucking twitch primes right now pay for it you fucking scumbags otherwise you know what in that scenario you're the fucking ones exploiting us aren't you so we can try some twitch primes right now go on but richard lewis also made a, a video recently which you guys can go watch uh where he talks about like you know, if people are unwilling to pay five dollars to watch a month to watch their favorite esports, which it does dozens of hours of broadcast, many of you who are watching this show, considering you're among the most hardcore the fans, problems, everyone giving you are unlike <laughs> the LCS fans, grateful, and you are entitled to a show. Continue, on. yeah, or go to our Discord, enjoy the conversation, and pay us six ninety nine a month for our Discord subscription, of which we get ninety percent of the revenue. Discord's very generous in the split that they give, and that's the best way to do it. But yeah, I mean, you guys like. If to Richard Lewis's point in the video, if you are not willing to pay five dollars a month, even though you probably watch more esports than you do Netflix, okay, and Netflix now costs like what fucking twenty two dollars a month or something, twenty bucks plus a month at least in the states for the ad free version, are you really watching four times as much Netflix as you are esports? Are you really doing that? Like you're probably watching more esports, and yet you guys are the ones who have a fucking riot. On on social media, if you ever if anybody ever dares say that you should pay for this content, I wouldn't fucking watch it anymore. Well, if you wouldn't watch it for five dollars a month, it was probably shit content and deserves to die. That's my that's my take, guys. Like I can just tell you, back in the day in 2010, I was paying twenty dollars a month at that time for GSL, and I fucking thought it was a bargain. I was like, damn, look how much content I get for $20. And I get this VOD library, so I don't have to stay up into the middle of the night because I lived in America to watch these Korean games. I thought it was banger value, banger value. Now, you guys won't even pay five bucks for a much better produced, much more high quality product. It's bullshit. By the way, I'll just throw this out there. One, Philip Hiram himself, when he worked as the chief gaming officer of EG, by your own logic fans, contributed to the problem that exists now with the overinflated players and bringing in people and signing massive names in jungle and top lane and fucking mid lane. Surely he contributed to that. But then he himself left and goes, well, my new job, put on the new... They, he may as well be like the, you know, the American government, Rich, where you see those stories where a guy's like, I work for the FDA, but then next time it's like, now I work for the company that the FDA approves the thing of. But now I'm back in the government for the FDA or I work in the financial I'm, sector. I'm now a lobbyist. I'm in the SEC. And they do that with it. He basically did that. He put a different hat on. And the second he put his union, Unster hat on, he just goes, these bloody teams are out of control. The way they've spent this industry and fucked it all up, like, give me a break, bro. So that I'll just say this. I'll rewind it. The worst part about this is that you can't take it at face value. Like, actually, fundamentally, as an abstract concept, as I said on that show, I am in favor of not only 
essentially semi-unionization like associations and especially denying labor because it's the only tool you have. But more importantly, I actually like the notion of a Philip Aram coming in who knows the space and fighting for players because I'll quickly rewind to something I saw Dom saying. Everyone's missed this. We made points on this show the last two or three years, Monty, that essentially the play the PA used to be a fake front. It was like the NWO in wrestling. They're not really against the WCW. They work for the WCW, you fucking idiots. Remember, Monty, when they made the LSPA? What it, LCSPA? It was, a, it was formed with a board of people, three of which were on, like, TSM. One of them was Bjergsen, who was a co-owner of TSM with equity in a team org, and that he was on the PA to battle Riot and the teams. And then they put in place those commissioners. One of the commissioners is just a massive Riot guy, if you don't like Chris Greeley guy. He was like, head of NA Esports, who's LCS Commissioner, like, they, that looked so fugazi that we criticised it loads over the years. Like, essentially, how can you police yourself? How can, an, how can a part owner also be the head of the fucking player association? These are absurd things. But what's funny is, I never actually thought, just like I didn't think there'd be a walkout, that you'd ever have a real PA that would actually try to battle Riot. So I actually like the idea someone did have the balls to go, you know, players, we could actually get together and just fight them. I just don't agree, essentially, with like the practical aspects and the specifics of what was done. So I kept selling on the episode to give him an out. We can talk about the general or we can talk about the specific, but let's pick which it is, you know, because if you want to talk about the general, I'm on the I'm on the side of people actually battling liars and people who have all the power over them. And in this case, by making them look bad, I just didn't agree with the way it was done personally. Yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable take. Um, is there other stuff we want to discuss about this this issue, or we kind of covered it all. Any final I, I words, did, Rich? I did just remember what Thorin was saying when you know this whole classic, uh, you know, just uh, do the right thing, TM or whatever. Do you remember? Maybe you said this deliberately, or maybe it was just in your subconscious. That was actually Lena's pin tweet on Twitter for like four oh, years. I know what you mean? No, it was, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it was, it's, it's not hard. It's not to that hard to not be a good person or something. Yeah, be a good person. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> It was rang in my brain, just the PTSD just hit. It's, it's, it's when I mean, the joke there would be, she was obviously doing an affirmation. That's what she, she it's basically, you know that meme of that guy, but you are a good person. You <laughs> are a good person who cares about other people. That's her just in the mirror to herself every day. So, she was wanting to see by the way, she opened her profile. By the way, guys, I mean, that's, that's just like some deep insight into her psychology because it is, in fact, very difficult to be a good person. It's extremely difficult <laughs> because being a good person involves taking stands that are unpopular or dangerous at times, right? Uh, whereas just letting things happen is not being a good person. You know, not having conflict for the sake of not ha having conflict is not inherently good. Some conflict is righteous. Like the holy war against DSM. It's definitely <laughs> expensive, unfortunately, to not just uh, it is. go. But no, the, no, the other thing. In the past, it cost us millions of dollars, literally from the old Saudis, you know, Frankie's pals that kill all the gay people, uh, her friends in the Middle East. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I. Her, according to, I'll never say that according to her. Go on. I, I don't know if I've said, I don't know if I've said this on a podcast before, but in, in a 2018 or like just at the end of H2K, we actually, we had this uh, a group called Oakwood who were like, had been previously looking for investment and to get into the space or whatever and they put us in contact with the saudi royal family in fact the princess of saudi arabia specifically okay. and she uh like francina wadia or something she, i can't remember but she was job. offering she was willing to pay literally millions to send us basically to saudi arabia to set up infrastructure in saudi arabia for esports and Obviously, that was a quick no. I would also say that it didn't seem to have any understanding whatsoever about the fact that you do realize there are no servers there and will not be any servers there and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, no. Also, just the last thing on the Lena thing. I I I know what you were saying was obviously kind of, you know, joking and speculative or whatever. Oh, but, was shocking, yeah. Le yeah, but at the same time... Lena has taken full credit in the past for how successful uh, Double Lift's YouTube and oh, podcast true. guests yeah. and booking have been. So I only have to assume, you know, if I'm going to give you credit for that, then I'm going to assume you're the one responsible Rich, for uploading that video. You have to understand, it's incredibly sexist to take the most celebrated, decorated and successful women and imply that their failures are in any way their responsibility. You are only to praise them and give them awards and put them in the Hall of Fame. You might not think that's true, but it is true, and if you want to keep your job, you'll say it's true. Okay, right, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So, so bless, blessed Lena for booking all those high viewed, amazing podcasts, and fuck you, Double Lift, for uploading that video. Bad Double Lift. That was all you. 
<laughs> and by the way, if you want to see some really funny content, just go and watch where Dom watch it because Dom's the king of the reaction stream. <laughs> go watch him watch Double Lift's videos. That's the fucking watch party you want to be a part of. Get the popcorn in, get the sodas, and just watch that because he, he just absolutely it's hilarious. Just go watch it. It's really funny. Shout out, Dom. <laughs> and by the way, it was also unfairly maligned when he stepped into this matter. Like, because the sad thing about this was all the fucking takes were so reductive, it was pathetic. Like, everything was just like, oh, you have to just only be only unilaterally on the player's side. Like, grow the fuck up, will you, kid? Just grow up, will you? Also, by the way, like, and even some people I've liked have sort of tweeted similar things, but all these, like, contextless tweets of, like, I stand with the players, fuck off. Like, unless you're going to actually put something out there where you're fully explaining your position and the reason how you've somehow mental gymnastics yourself into having that position, then... That's just, uh, that is the equivalent of putting up a fucking LGBTQ avatar up for one month and then get rid of it. Like, what does that mean? In fucking Saudi Arabia, like, hello, but, we're here in Riyadh. Also, it's win. like, it's won. free, it's free point scoring, isn't it? It's, imagine if I tweeted, I'm with the teams or even better, yeah, I'm with well, Riot. I'm with Riot. Like, yeah. a great tweet. And it would be true. You but I'm not going to fucking tweet, tweet that. that. I'm going to tweet, I, I'm with Riot. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I even said this on the last episode. I did bait people with that. But it's because... To be fair, Rich, it was a long post. If you click it, it was on those all over 280 character ones. Yep. I say my whole opinion, but I did make the top part that's the visible part say I don't support the walkout. Of course, because <laughs> I know how this fucking game's played, Hobie. I played Reddit. I told you, some people play the mandolin. Some people play a flute. Well, depends if they want a job at Riot. I play fucking Twitter. There you go. I am my accordion. <laughs> so my, so my, my instrument would be accordion or mouth harmonica because I have to be really annoying that no one... Like, Shut up playing that like doo, 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 doo. that's me on Twitter. Uh, okay, there is there is some other news that I think we should talk about if we're done with the the walkout subject. Um, That's the obviously, end of the three horsemen. Now we'll talk about some other stuff. <laughs> obviously, uh, the the only league running right now is LPL, and I've I've seen a few of the matches, but I haven't really dove in yet. Even though there have been quite a few bangers, but I think also one of the the announcements that came out today was that Shocks is not going to be participating in the summer split of LEC. Um, obviously, Shocks has had some you know, really shitty, uh, unfortunate personal uh, issues uh, that were outside of her control, including, you know, um, deaths in her family. And so I think it's it's understandable that she she wants to take a break. She says she's going to take a break from all events up until the LEC playoffs, I guess, the live event and Worlds. So and she said, you know, that she it she implied rather that she hasn't been booked booked as talent for those events yet um but would like to participate in them but is currently just going to take a break and maybe do some those events or some cs events if she's invited later in the year i mean it's almost implied maybe i am clone that's in august i believe which is sure. obviously i think she's appeared in past ESL no i don't events. think it, yeah she's appeared there but it, i don't think i am cologne because that would be still be in the window of the lec summer split so i think she wants oh, to she do it after. for the year that's in august it, Monty, okay. the secret with esports is this. <laughs> they make all the heavy lifting on certain words in the yeah, sentence. Sure, but sure, if you sure, read sure, it really sure. quick, no, look, I'll say it. We even did an episode on this channel that was a celebration of Shox's career where we had an art contest where people made all this amazing art. Some of it actually was amazing. There was one guy made this one where it was like an art piece where every like leaf in a fucking image was a different color screen that represented something thematically about Shox's career in a country she'd worked with. Yep. The people were going fucking next level on this shit. So we've already celebrated a career, one of the all-time greats the problem is in her particular case like i've seen some people take the mental health break where like i just know behind the scenes they immediately just began streaming eating pizzas drinking sodas and go and like going oh, i'm getting fucking into it and i was like is that really a mental health break broke here hers mm. is obviously a legitimate one i mean she's someone who's actually struggled with this if you've ever saw her on social media She's had the best method actor ever. She's had been through a lot of turmoil this year. She's had many, many times where she, if you don't know, she suffers from insomnia and she obviously has had like anxiety or depression over some of the things that have happened in her life. So no, I, I think that's, by the way, also someone who's had a mega tenured career beyond when she was negotiating with Riot, like whenever it was last year, someone who's almost never taken breaks, just been going the whole time for what, 10 years now or something. So I think it's actually a totally justified time to take a break. Wish her well. Can I, can I ask you both, though, as you've both obviously done talent on a lot of different events and so on, uh, like, just, again, like, 
obviously, as you say, from from the outside perspective, it fully justify. I have no reason to believe that um, you know this isn't something that she should do, probably for herself. But the only slight issue, or maybe there isn't an issue at all, but as two people who have worked a lot of events and so on, does any part of you think, oh, fuck you, when you see? Uh, yeah, taking a break, but I'll be back for <laughs> LEC finals and Wells. It's like... It, it you know, I don't know, DeFisco like... retired from casting and then casted, like, a world, so... Oh, fair enough. Yeah, true. <laughs> but it's like, but it's, it is kind I of mean, like... I mean, I did get salty about that, but... Um, Here's but... the real problem. Like, everyone knows this. I think she even herself implied this. One of the things that does make a lot of people feel very anxious as talent is you always think... This is what LS thinks, by the way, guys. Why he won't stop doing every region? They all think every day I take off could be the end. And what happens is as soon as I say I'm not doing it, I might lose all my steam, all my credibility, and people will hire me. Now, that's not true. Like, they will hire Moses and LS and Sharks. Of course they will. But the feeling is, if I don't make it really clear, Rich, that I'll still come back for some of those if I'm available. If you don't do that, fans will repeat on Reddit a million times for the updates, and they all repeat what each other said. They'll just all go, well, Sharks is taking a break. Sharks isn't going to be here this year. Shocks and because they'll keep doing that i get it you might actually worry like wait i'm almost like building pr against mm. getting hired again so i actually i know why you might do that as like an insurance angle sort of like you know but i just want to make sure people know i am going to work events again in the future and second half of the year or whatever you know sure. i can see both sides of it um i mean uh, yeah i mean i obviously like i uh, you know quick shot did this as well right yep. he took a break for a world um which i think is understandable i, know, Nick, I mean I, I can break i think it was last year or something was it Look, guys, I mean, yeah, it, it was a couple of years ago, but I mean, it, it's like, um, I mean, you know, last year, from oh, the Medic, yeah, 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 took yeah, it for yeah. worlds as well, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, Captain Flowers decided to stay home and do his own stream, which I thought was, you know, totally reasonable. I, look, all I can say is for you guys is that for casters, you know, the schedule is really brutal. Like I've run the circuit and I've run it in a way that only really the LPL casters do right now, in which I was casting 10 best of threes across five days a week throughout the entire year and then heading into, you know, um, you know, world championship and all of this events. And you have to travel. And because of the way that Riot runs the events, you're traveling to a different place every week for world. So you're literally gone for five or six weeks. A lot of the time it's hard. Like it's very, very difficult. Um, and so after many, many years of doing this, I think it's totally understandable why people would want to take a short break. But I also think we have to examine the broader ecosystem of esports. Like, I'm sure Shox gets paid well by the LEC. She's one of the few people who fights for her value, as we saw when she kind of held out from the, the early uh, days of LEC last year when she wasn't on the broadcast because her negotiations appeared to have broken down. But I also think that right now it's better to be in Counter-Strike because there's at least multiple tournament operators between Blast and, you know, ESL. Also, you know, ESL doesn't really care about losing money right now because they're, you know, shooting for for market share. Um, and they're, they're funded by the Saudi sovereign wealth fund. So, you know, they're, they're in a place where they can actually pay potentially a lot more money and, you know, straight up CS casters make more money, the good ones than the good league of legends casters do. That's just true because there's competition within the ecosystem for good talent. And as you'll see again, back to latest news, Richard Lewis put out an article today. If you go look at his sub stack or his Twitter, uh, talking about how now ESL and Blast are trying to leverage exclusivity or at least semi-exclusivity with talent because they think it's valuable. So clearly the the talent is more valued in the Counter-Strike space. And yeah. with the new version of Counter-Strike coming out, maybe that's a really attractive option for somebody like Shox, who the Counter-Strike community really likes. She's an excellent at her job. And perhaps she could go do something that's much more profitable there. She has literally taken time off of League of Legends to go do you know, Counter-Strike events. Like, that's been something she's done. I think this so, actually... Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, no, I was just going to say, I do think this... Because this, this is something we've actually talked about before, um, where I was very... I, obviously, the fact that she did it and was successful is obviously great or whatever, but I think it'll be interesting to see, from Riot's perspective, how Summer Split goes um, without shocks, in the sense that it's always been my contention that because of how Riot models their hiring and firing now of casters, I don't think I was actually really surprised that Riot did cave to shocks because I actually don't think it will have any impact on viewership whatsoever. But the only way you could ever know that is if she takes a split off. And I think now you're actually going to see that. And I don't want this to be correct necessarily, at least not for those reasons. But I think they might actually just look back at the summer split and be like, why the fuck are we paying shocks 
three x what we're paying this person when actually the desk host role has no impact on viewership. And I assume that's what happened with Dash to a certain extent. Another guy who is really good, in my opinion, at the desk host job, and yep. they were probably like, wait. But it doesn't actually matter. He could be as good or this is such an established plug and play product at this point. It doesn't actually really matter if we have shocks for three times the money or dash for however much the money or the, the, the Dracos fills in. It doesn't actually impact viewership. And I think you'll see it won't just be impact quick viewership. shot, I imagine it'll do it. If well, I guess. Yeah. You know, um, I've got a quick update for you, Monty. Just a little detail because you'll enjoy this. This is just for people who enjoy the deep lore of summoning insight and want to keep track on old stories. If you go to the EG underscore Danny Twitch channel, it last streamed two months ago in April. <laughs> so that was real. <laughs> totally real, guys. We're keeping up here with uh, the, the Danny numbers. Real. And also, the, the no face cam Lost Ark streams are really crushing it for EG sponsors, by the way, even when that happened. So, of course, this is how it turned out, guys. It was never about him being a content creator. It was just total bullshit. It's also Obviously. disgusting that he would play the game Lost Ark because the theme of the story of the Ark was actually a righteous God washing away all the sin from the world, which is exactly the opposite of what Danny and his family allowed to happen in his case. Jesus Christ. But um, to, to your point, though, Monty, uh, uh, that I was just going to finish up on, in Counter-Strike, I think there are tangible uh, differences when you have, like, certain casting duos, for example, casting something. I think that actually yep. does have a meaningful impact if you have, like, Henry and Sadakist or something like that. I think there yeah. is a real difference. In League, at least in, like, Western League, I really don't feel that that's that strong. I think sometimes if you have, like, a casting trio for a final or a world semi or something, people will, like, rave about it a little bit. But I do think the actual impact on viewership is very limited. So I think in one sense it's very risky for her. But as you say, like, if her goal is to sort of eventually transition across, then, you know, then it's obviously well, a good thing. Let me Let me put it this way. You know, besides money, which, again, is always going to be capped in League of Legends because they have a monopoly on where what shocks can charge to do things. Can she get bigger in League than she already is? No, like it, it, it's purely from a career perspective. I mean, this is why this is one of the reasons why I left League of Legends to go do Overwatch League was because I couldn't get bigger than I was in League of Legends. It was actually impossible at the time. So what was my career trajectory? I wanted to learn other skills. I wanted to be part of creating this thing. And it fucking sucks that it failed for a variety of reasons. But the opportunity was for major career growth, which then led to me doing a bunch of other stuff in terms of consulting, in terms of running Flashpoint. Like, all of these things gave me additional skills. Where if I just stayed as a caster in League of Legends, I would have eventually just found myself in this predicament where... At the time, at least I could negotiate against Riot because I always had OGN, right? There were two forces within the scene and OGN I knew was ride or die with me. They had my back the whole way through. Awesome company to work with. And the thing about Koreans is that culturally they are insanely loyal. Like once once you're together and once you pledge loyalty to each other, basically, like they're very trustworthy, like just culturally very trustworthy. So, you know, I love the people I worked with at OGN. Uh, for that reason. And they also, you know, loved when I would antagonize Riot because they hated Riot. So they thought it was fucking hilarious. And like they enjoyed me doing it because I could move the needle for them in ways that they couldn't do publicly. So, you know, this is all to say that if I was shocks, here, here's just some facts for you guys. So how can I couch this in sort of a vague way? My agent came to me with an offer from a major American Sports League to do some video game content. That offer was triple the best rate day, day rate that I have ever had. And it was for something that got very low viewership. If you are shocks, okay, and you want to continue to be kind of in the eye of esports, you can easily do a bunch of Counter Strike 2 content. I imagine you could sign a, a contract with ESL or Blast very readily. And you could do all of these side gigs, this kind of work, things like Twitch rivals, things that people don't know about, which makes you way more money, guys, like way more money, like gross money. Um, and you don't have to, like, sacrifice your popularity to do it. So my question would be, really, what is the upside to continuing to work with Riot if you're shocks? Like, it's not money. It's not additional fame. She can actually do more for her career in terms of popularity by just straight moving to CS2. And especially with CS2 coming out, I mean, this is going to be true of a bunch of casters. You know what I mean? Or a bunch of desk hosts. Because as you put, Rich, I don't think she moves the needle for the desk, at least in League of Legends. And 
you know, I would just start to look at other potential opportunities because the ceiling has been reached, I think, yeah. in terms of her League of Legends career. And it, and she's not going to make additional, you know, significant additional money. Riot's going to draw the hard line like they have with all of the casters rates and say no more. Like, this is where we're willing to go. No more. And that's it. That's it. I've got a detail that I should have mentioned earlier. This is where also basic journalism skills are OP as fuck in a media landscape with constant stimuli and people getting lost in the story, etc. One of the first things you do, like I did in my Frankie video, is you establish a timeline so you know who's telling the truth and what happened first. Here's a detail that I bet even people in this call, I didn't know myself, I just looked it up now and realized it. I didn't think of this myself. Do you know why I know the players didn't decide any of those demands, Monty? The demands were posted before the vote ever took place. You can go look up the timeline. No, no. no. It, it could no, have... no. Publicly, the demands were posted before there was ever a vote. So uh, my counter argument to that was it could have been the council of players that had decided on those demands with the leadership, the board of the LCSPA. So some of the players might have had a say in that, to be fair. Might. The word might is doing all the lifting sure. there. By the way, why do I need to have... Here's the thing. I love all people like Philip Aram. They want specifics and things like that, but they're never willing to give anything more than vagaries themselves. That everything's, well, I could do, and it might do, and maybe in the players do it. Like, by the way, can we just acknowledge one last thing as well? When he did that insane thing where he read the minds of pro players and said that, like, they sit there and look down the line at the people they play with, and they just really care about that person as a human being and how he does, and they don't care if he comes from Korea or from nothing. What the fuck was he talking about? What the fuck was he talking about when he did that? Like, that, to me, was pure fiction. I don't know about you, Rich, what your experience with players is, but, like... Even most successful teams aren't actually friends. Even in successful teams, by the way, sometimes even at the end of your success, you get that guy booted out the team. It's not really that the team just let him go. To me, that was that that was so crazy because I actually thought I was establishing a fairly reasonable point that most people, by the way, he himself implied it with why players shouldn't d demand less money, act in their own self-interest first and foremost. That's just assumed to me in your profession, you know. Yeah, I don't. I think having worked with like a lot of different styles of players and i mean generally speaking i would say that you'll get one or two people obviously this is purely anecdotal and it can vary and i'm sure that that cloud nine roster when they were first having success together or whatever were generally very friendly or whatever but it's usually a couple of people i mean vander and yankos for example seem like pretty good friends when they were on h2k my understanding is they don't even really talk that much after H2K. So I don't even know how much of a friendship that even was. But you don't, it's not like they're not skipping arm in arm down the street to get ice cream after scrims, you know? Usually it's, oh, what's that? Last scrim over? Oh, and then they just all go on fucking Fortnite or whatever it is they do after they play scrims, like zoned in, not socializing. Like I, the idea that successful teams are like, best buddies or anything like that it that is definitely a rarity and i also think by the way that's one of the reasons and i don't necessarily think this was like contingent to any success they had or whatever in fact i know it's not because i'll give you a second example immediately afterwards that g2 team was legitimately got on pretty well like they, they were generally all sort of friends but as i said you'll notice then they added black to the roster and not particularly uh overwhelmingly awesome historical team and everyone raved about flax and how much of a good friend he was and so on so i don't think there's really a particular correlation there anyway and i think friendship is definitely monster overrated in sports and esports for sure I don't think that's controversial. As we know, some of the greatest sports teams of all times are just dicks to each other. <laughs> and Jordan and Pippin. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Shaq and Kobe. In fact, you can say that the more successful they are at the absolute echelons of the highest sport sometimes, the more adversarial they are. I mean, if you are a born winner and you have that, you know, that quote unquote, till he's got that dog in him, often that means you do bite the people who are next to you if they fuck up. So, yeah, I think it uh, doesn't mean anything. Oh, by the way, tiny small aside, because I've just uh, had this just still on my screen from earlier. Did you guys know that ne this is this? Honestly, this might be the most mind blowing thing of this whole scenario. Did you know that Double Lift is 30 next month? He's 30. Ne that <laughs> man child streaming with the mental age of a 15 year old telling you, I didn't realize we might actually not play the video games. That guy is 30 <laughs> next. That guy's 30 next month. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. No. I mean, I've always well. thought the problem Double Lift has is he's got the technology the best Asian players have, but then the brain of a Westerner. 
It's the worst, <laughs> it's the best of, and wave both and worst of both worlds at the same time. It's just all merged together. <laughs> if people don't know, by the way, the reason Doublelift would be entitled makes the most sense. He's a guy who didn't re- work a real job. He came from being some teenage prodigy to get to literally being kicked out of his house to going into the LCS to playing for years and years and years, having all the success, getting paid enormous amounts of money. Like if people knew how many more millions he's made than like reckless, per- like, it's ridiculous. It's actually a joke how much money he's made. It's being paid a king's ransom. In fact, many kings. You get a few kings for that. Then on top of that, you think of his whole career. He's done stuff like there's that time. It, look, it was years and years ago before even all the pop off. There was that time he just tweeted and had said that like the FBI was investigating him having like 200k of crypto stolen because he didn't know his password was double lift or mm-hmm. something like that. You know what I mean? Like he's on that fucking level. He's not really a smart guy, is he? Like like I said, there's all the shit about the TSM stuff, like where he should have been in, but then he said he didn't want to be. Like the whole thing's a fucking train wreck, mate. The joke is like I said in my little TikTok. I love about Doublelift. I own ironically love him because he's also another Seinfeld character, just some wacky cri- fucking, what's his name? Like, I can't remember the name of the guy who was played by the Jurassic Park guy, the one who, uh, Newman. He's like Newman because Reggie has to be Kramer. He's Newman, Reggie's mate there in that sense. He just comes in, oh, hey, Jerry, what's going on? I'm like, oh, brilliant, Newman's back. Let's see what stupid shit he's going to do. Because the thing about Doublelift is, you see it in those videos about the LCSPA. It's like he himself is reacting in real time to his own words. And he's sort of shocked, like, oh, shit, what have I just said? Oh, and you can just see the little look on his face, like, oh, oh no. And then also, he, he, this is what, I've said this years ago. I did a whole thing on Summer Insight. He has the worst poker face of all time, of all time. Because when it is just all fine, he's laughing like, Haha, I don't even care, guys. But then suddenly he'll go like, he looks like he's in the fucking Blair Witch Project. Like, and when those eyes come out, homie, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And I can <laughs> see everything bare inside there, mate. So that's it for that. Right, also, uh, uh, if we're ready to move on, there's an interesting topic that just dropped on social media about Twitch terms of service, which is also going to really okay. affect esports. Are you ready for this one? On? Come on. Hold on. Hold on. We got to link. I got to link you guys if you haven't seen this yet. All right. So on Twitter, there's a reporter uh, who does like streamer business reporting and they have new brand content guidelines. So get this. On-stream logos of brands are limited to 3% of screen size. But here's the big one for esports. Burned-in video ads are not allowed. So what that means, guys, is, you know, all of those esports ads. So, like, if you're watching, for example, LEC, and you see those Red Bull ads that they put in between the broadcast. Now, those are not programmatic ads that are served by Twitch. Those are the, the things that you get on top, like when a streamer runs ads that are the ones that sell to Twitch. They're the ones that you watch regardless of whether you have, you know, uh, whatever, Twitch Turbo, I think, is the ad-free version subscription. Um, so, basically, I don't know... Now, for individual stream, maybe there's an exception for esports, but esports runs off of burned in advertisements. Like every esport has burned in ads. So how the fuck do you get around this? Like, and be on Twitch? That is insanity. Way, think about it. At least Riot Monty has the game rev. ESL and Blast are done. It's over. It's over. Although I will say, this is where we're smarter than the average bear, Monty, because we don't have burned in ads. We just happen to say things that are straight fire that are ads. So guess what? In the end, we win that one too. Although I will say, this isn't like a minor thing if people don't know. Like, essentially, this is the end of the esports industry. Like, it's bad enough what we were talking about with LCS, the franchise leagues. This is just the Re- end. Remember, remember the, the last the, form the revenue, of revenue that the esports yeah, industry had? Sponsorship. That's it. That, the revenue was, that was the sponsorship. So <laughs> it's over, isn't it? This is over, boys. Shout out Alex Garfield for selling all that shit and Twitch and all that stuff. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Shout yeah, out I, to, I actually, uh, shout I, I out to Trainwrecks think... TV and Stake.com. Uh, hey, pretty what? sure they'll be raking it in pretty soon with everyone moving over. That is out. Outra- that is absurd, though. Like, I, I mean, obviously, for anyone living under a rock, Amazon own Twitch, and obviously, they're the numbers are not adding up somewhere along the line. But yeah. this is also off the back of them changing the sub splits. For those who don't know, if you had a special deal, you could get more than the 250 per sub. You could get up to four or even five, I think, in some rare situations. Um, yeah, most people, um, like the OG people, so like on my channel and on this channel, actually, uh, we have 350 uh, out of the $5 because we're I, this channel has been grandfathered for like 10 years. Yeah. So that's probably an oversight. I- Take care of that, will you, Amazon? You know the, which way the red's spotted. What are you doing there? Why are you being silly? I can actually, I can actually story top you because the uh, completely dormant, useless, never streamed on before HDK one has four. 
So, you know, go sub over there, guys. I don't know where the money goes. I don't have access to it. So actually, maybe don't. Let me change a few details and then uh, get sub in. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, this is, I assume just like, so you, you guys remember when uh, they, they were like, no more gambling on Twitch, but it's actually just casinos and it's not sports betting, yeah, which course. obviously, like, if they did that, they would just lose the entire Counter-Strike scene. So they, they weren't willing to do that. I would imagine that the esports channels are going to be exempted from this. Because, you know, clearly those are generating massive amounts of viewership for Twitch and like they're not just going to get rid of all of League of Legends or Counter-Strike or every eSport, basically, for example. So I don't think we need to freak out about this. But what what is interesting is that they are saying that basically this is an acknowledgement that the power of creators like individual streamers has gotten so great that they're going to they are going to increasingly be making more and more brand deals that Twitch doesn't get a cut of because they've been so garbage at monetizing their own platform. And so they don't want that to occur. And they want they want the creators to be dependent on Twitch subs rather than baked in ads because the 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 marketing industry is coming around, guys, where they're realizing that XQC having a hundred thousand concurrent viewers is extremely fucking valuable. Like it's extremely thing, Monty, valuable. What you've just said there is also a bigger point I always try to make to people. Not because I knew this coming out the womb. I learned this a few years ago. The way restrictions and regulations work in industries is to the benefit of the biggest companies in those industries. It's the other way around. You all think, oh, the, the government's regulating them. No, no. They ask for the regulation and go, oh, no, a slap on the hand. But the regulation fucks the little guy who was trying to break in the scene. So as Monty says, here's what will happen. The biggest TOs in esports will go to Twitch or they'll just be given... A, a, essentially a lease to do this. They'll be allowed to have the the burned-in ad because they're part of the bigger picture of Twitch and their viewership means something and they have leverage. What will happen now is this, Monty, though. Me and you can't make a small company tomorrow and crowdfund it and beat ESL. We won't be allowed to do it. That is what the actual policy will apply if I had to guess. Because I'm with you. I don't really think that'll, they'll make Blast no. ESL just go bye-bye tomorrow. And, and, and here's the other reason is because here's the other reason they won't do that is because they're not going to piss off the devs because remember that the developers own all of the IP. So it's not just about esports. It's that if Riot gets pissed enough, they can basically pull all Riot games off of Twitch and say like, you don't have the rights to broadcast our intellectual property. We fucking own it. So I don't think there's any world like people are freaking out. I don't think there's any world where this applies to esports because the danger is simply too great because if Riot's like, well, Twitch, if you're going to make our revenue fucking suck, then I'm going to make your revenue fucking suck. And especially because we know Riot is, who knows when it's going to come out, but they've said that they have been working on a streaming platform. And I can tell you behind the scenes, they've been working on this for years and years and years. I've known about it for a long time. Um, you know, you there's a day in CSGO. Everyone's trying to do it once you get off the platform, basically make the yeah, own last, last TV, yeah. et cetera. So like, I don't think they're actually going to apply this to esports because it's way too dangerous, especially fucking with the publishers. Um, so yeah, I would be surprised. By the way, but why is say, it's like, it's like this? a pseudo monopoly as a result? Why are there no like just normal operators who believe in the premise of a free market and actually think we can all succeed off the basis of our merits and how well we do and the relationships that make sense between us? Why is everything some fucked up dark Game of Thrones thing where it's like swear fealty to me, or I will kill you, peon? Mm -hmm. It's like I am your battle lord. You will swear fealty to me, or I will destroy you in the torture rack. Like I am your king. You will bow before me. It's like I am God Himself. Like man, why? Is Every, why is everything in esports just like but, you know the, the lame thing it's just fear and fucking intimidation I, all the I, way up. i wish it worked like game of thrones thorin so i could have trial by combat with riot so at least i would have some way to baby whip no because then what they do is they put the mountain versus you and then you just get fucking wrecked wouldn't you so there you go even in that scenario you die you die in the end anyway but technically i will say people get that wrong if you look it up because the red viper had poison on his dagger technically they both lost because that guy became like undead after that so in a way he did win he just was too cocky he was like double lift he basically entered it he was like you know what it's not enough that we might get this walkout yeah i don't even want there to be uh trial by combat you should just apologize now like and it, basically that was double lift. Did someone get that and then obviously have like the have else have riot games logo pull double lift over and push his eyeballs in as lena goes no oh well <laughs> I'll just continue on without him. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think I think also just talking about the meta a little bit um, for League of Legends. I think a broader concept that we should we should discuss is that uh, you know there has been complaints about the staleness of the meta this year, and like obviously these clips of of Cadrill have come up um, with him like 
I mean, obviously, like, you know, fake outrage for entertainment about the staleness of the meta, you know, flipping out on his stream when we get to see, you know, Zeri Yumi versus Aphelios Lulu for the umpteenth That's time this year. What actor he actually has become, isn't it, Rich? You knew this oh, guy. Like, it, he used to be a mega quiet little nerd. Like, that's why when I first brought him on my shows, I was like, bloody hell, mate. What you're saying, straight fire, but it's so boring. Like, no one's going to too dry. Now he actually is just like the ultimate reaction. Like, oh, my yeah. God, what the? D carry out. Just like, oh, it's ridiculous. It's amazing. I love it. Uh, yeah, I, so I think like what's what's interesting about this current situation is first off, thank God they banned Yumi from MSI. That was the biggest, the, the biggest, you know, solid that Riot has done us in terms of champion bans in the competitive space. Because now Yumi is not incredibly oppressive as she used to be, but she still has very strong synergy with Zeri, as we've seen in some of the LPL games that have happened so far. But basically what this meta has turned into is like this cleanup janitorial meta where if you get one kill in the mid and late game, like Viego or Zeri or Jinx just reset all over your ass and then the game just ends. And I have to say, like, the longer this goes on, like we started to see the creep of this towards the playoff of MSI where teams just realized that you could do this. And it's getting pretty stale because it feels like the stakes are just insanely high for like one misplay in a game and it, everything just ends. By the way, I'll just throw this out there. This is where I'm so legit. I don't even go after just clicks. I, I, the joke here is I just get clicks for who I am, mate. I just put my real opinions. I get all the clicks anywhere. You saw those fucking analytics I posted. I had like 44 million fucking views last month or whatever on Twitter. But I actually have headlines I don't even go with that are even more fire. Like a real quote. This is a real quote from that Zven Reflections interview I did. Was he said that he, he wasn't joking, that he thinks Aphelios is the pinnacle of champ design. That's a headline I could have run with all day long. I didn't, I did it one about like fucking some else like Bjergsen or some shit like that. Some, some other fucking angle. So I, I think what's mad is they're never, ever going to have a perfect meta. Ne it's not going to ever come close. We're never going to have fucking brood war or whatever people think fondly of. So to me, it's always pick your poison. And the question is, what do you want to be OP? So like Yumi does suck, but at the same time, it's a support champion. You know what I mean? There's, sometimes there's like a top lane champion that's broken as fuck. I mean, I, I even think, quite frankly, people don't complain about it because no one cares about top laners. But in a way, isn't Cassante still overtuned? Doesn't it have like a million stuns and he can still go forwards and shields? And he, It has that thing people used to do when they used to build tank Echo, where it was doing damage, but it had all the tank items and it could get out. It's like, what is this champion? like? So I think some of that's still wild too. Like To me, the, the meta is scuffed in some ways, but I also say, I think actually the last year and a half probably been the best League of Legends been in many, many, many years. Like in general, they have sort of nailed some of the metas. Yeah, I think yeah. that, oh, sorry, I, I was just yeah. going to say, um, well, it reminds me of, uh, this is going back, but we played a best of five against Fnatic, and I remember in game five, it was just happened that on this patch, there was this weird thing where like the millisecond, the clock ticked over whatever it was, like 28 minutes or something, the death time was like shot through the roof. And we were like, I don't, whatever it was, like 12, two up in kills or something, lost one innocuous team fight, and they just ended the game off that at like 28 minutes. And the casters were even like, oh, whoa, uh, okay, I guess the game's just over. And I remember this happened again. We were sort of joking about it uh, before on a different podcast when uh, it was uh, T1 versus Genji, I think, when Cassante went over the blue buff wall and took whoever it was out of the fight. And they were like, oh, no, now after all that, the game's just going to end. Oh, that really sucks. But I actually looked at the clock. It was actually fairly early in the game, and they just ended the fight off just this random team fight. So I do think that these are some, some things that are actually fairly easy to tweak. Obviously, you can do it with champions or how quickly it takes to push towers. Like, you can just buff towers, for example, if you don't want to change the death timers. But to me, that aspect is a fairly easy tweak. When it comes to Yumi... Uh, to me, Yumi's a weird one because Yumi is such a, let's be honest, it's a really skilled, like people will argue there's nuance or whatever, but it's a, it's a pretty skillless champion for the most part. And to me, it's okay that that champion exists if it's underpowered and it just, you know, it's used in low elo for people to learn the game. It's like a, basically like a tutorial champion or whatever. Like it, I don't think it should be competitively viable though. I don't think something that is so basic and skillless should ever be overtuned. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Surely you want high skill ceiling to get the absolute maximum uh, sort of worth out of a champion, not low ceiling. So I think it's kind of 
unforgivable that you can have multiple periods of time in the competitive game where Yumi is really like S tier. That doesn't it should never be pick ban. Like it should never be like default has to be pick banned. I think that's just absurd. So I say nerf that little shit into the ground. I mean they did just change her quite a lot, right? So I'm not really sure how that's gonna play out like in the in the new season or whatever like to, to see um because i haven't really watched lpl yet so i don't really know how those it's games not, have been going it, it's just still extremely strong okay well i just say nerf that <laughs> shit into the ground nerf it and keep nerfing it until lpl teams stop picking it she, that would seem like a pretty she's good been, barometer she's the most banned champion in the league with 42 bands and she's been played in six games and is four and two by I the mean, way, I, the other thing, uh, I've actually remembered the real reason I didn't use the Aphelios quote. It's because I had the banger Reggie quote, where Reggie, when he would come in the LCS reward reviews for TSM, would unironically say to Sven, why don't you dodge Kaiser Q, which is a targeting ability. <laughs> now, what's great there is, in this analogy, everyone on Twitter and Reddit is Reggie, because you're like, LCS teams, why don't you just spend less money and have better results and develop any talent and not get into money troubles? Like, you're just like that. It's too early. Mate, the ability's target at this point in time. Like we had to fix that ten years ago, you moron. You can't dodge it now. It's, it's over, isn't it? In that case, just I don't know, just dissolve the league and make all that hundreds of millions worth nothing, and just make a new league that's a challenger league. Like same people, by the way. I kept saying for ten years, I hate franchised leagues. I hate not having open circuits. You idiot! It's the only way we're all going to make money from all the sponsors. Like that's probably the worst thing about Reddit. It's just the pure gaslighting. It's the fact that they'll repeat back to you your own opinion and go, "We always thought this." Like. Bro, I'm not even joking. If you go onto Reddit, they all now claim that, like, everyone knew that the Overwatch League would fail. Everyone knew that, like, this didn't make sense to have franchising. Everyone knew that, you know, of course the Academy players do get paid too much. Like, the new thing on Reddit is you just take, essentially, the most popular opinion now and you just repeat it. It's just garbage. It's just garbage. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think... I, I, as as much to your point earlier, Thorne, about the the meta being good, I actually really enjoyed the world's meta last year, I and know. I was enjoying the the recent I meta was good too. Up, yeah, up until like you know deeper into MSI, um, where it did get kind of stale. I feel, and even a well, lot of the big changes. Lost. Whatever, it's it's an old joke. <laughs> but it's, it's a good one. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's because I, I got bored when the Korean teams lost. No, no Dude, not because of that. Yes, mid lane. Get out of the fucking game, I say. Get out of <laughs> the game, and also fucking playing Zaya. I don't think so. <laughs> I just, I you know, I just don't want to continue to see champions like Annie. To your point, Rich, like Annie and Yumi dominate the meta in that yes. are very like binary, low skill expression champions. And I, I still don't see an issue with Yumi being banned forever from pro play because they clearly want people who don't play League of Legends to play this champion. And that's fine for solo queue, but can we, why can't we just ban Yumi forever? Like, do we really lose anything if Rai is just like, you know what? We have to have this champion for business reasons, but it is fucking terrible for pro play. So let's just not have it in pro play. Like, why isn't that an option? Worked at MSI. Did anybody complain about not watching Yumi at MSI? No. This is the thing, though. I think that you can't ban it because then what will happen is the narrative will just change into pro players saying, why am I getting this shit in high elo? I never have to play that. I think you have to nerf it so that it's just unplayable. Or just delete it if you want. Just <laughs> refund whoever got bought the skins and delete it. Like, I don't know. But I, I think, you, as I said, I do think they'll just pivot into complaining that they have to play against it in solo queue. And then you say, okay, well, not for high elo, which is Masters Plus or whatever. And then D1 players like, oh my God, why the fuck do I have to play against Yumi? Like, to me, the only solution <laughs> is you nerf it. But This is know. why, to me, I actually agree with this Ven point. Once it wasn't overtuned, like the first six months or whatever, the reason Aphelios is a good champion is because it's really really fucking difficult to make be OP as fuck. It isn't like just the simple yeah. aspect of Yumi. It does have a high but skill cap. It's like, I even will dispute the Annie point. Look, I'm not a fan of watching the champion. I think it's bad. But I'll tell you what, just go and look at how fucking Knight played Annie versus how Faker played Annie. If there's no hands involved, then what's going on? In theory, people would even tell me Faker is supposed to be smarter than Knight. Like, there's still hands. There's still, like, timings. There's still what you do with your teammates. So my thing is, like what Rich said, I don't mind really difficult things. I like things to be OP. Just make it really high skill cap to reach that. The problem with Yumi is it doesn't do anything. Just you just sit back and it just fucking can't. The joke is Mercer has a whole fucking LC LEC career because of you, me. And so, in a way, you could say that you are some MVPs, but that's that's a bit more of an edgy take. A little bit more of an edgy one that one.
Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I will say at least one of the one of the mercies behind a lot of the league starting later than LPL is I think it's gonna cause Riot to react more quickly um to some of these changes. In fact, uh I saw that Riot August tweeted uh like an, an hour ago. Right? Yeah, he's one of the designers saying that they are changing uh, her synergy with tri uh, Trinity Force, which has been an issue, especially with the new ADC itemizations. Um, so that, and also shields for enchanters, the way she interacts with shields. So um, I think that the, it's a small mercy. I mean, for many reasons that the LCS was delayed, chief among them that I don't have to watch it. Um, but also that at least most of these leagues, like LCK is starting this week. We still have a couple weeks till LEC begins. Uh, L LCS, we just don't know when or if it's going to be back. I imagine it'll be back next week. Not this week, but ne next week, if I had to guess. Um, and so I think, like, at least there's going to be some time to get some patches down so we don't have to suffer through this for very much longer. But I will say that a lot of this is disappointing. So. Oh, yeah, not, by the not way. Not my favorite meta. To answer Rich, though, he's fallen into his own trap there, hasn't he? Because he's made the stupid assumption that Riot and the people who they balance for are, in any context, people who know about the pro scene. Remember, there was that game dev who worked at Riot, who I guess this is just part of the like no shame society we're in and just acceptance of all people and their failures and celebration of failure. Because there was that game dev who came out and said that they're in like gold or something. Do you remember the one I'm on about? There was one that famously came out. Do you know what oh, I'm yeah, about? yeah, yeah, yeah. And she just said they were like a gold. Yeah. Player or something mental like that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's who no, the game I think for. it was even. I thought it was even for like some notoriously awful design champion as well. I can't remember who the champion was, but it was like the justification was uh, interesting to say the least. It might even have been a Felios. Was it a Felios? Did she okay, do a Felios? Does anyone know? Anyone in chat know? Um, Don't worry about it. Well, whatever. Um, I, I have to say, the lead, I still, the, lead I still, design, the lead balance designer is low bronze, according to Yaska. Okay. Low bronze. Well, I, I, I do appreciate... I like on this guy with my pike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do appreciate, by the way, that, uh, you know, at least for one of the, the main uh, benefits of Freak going onto the balance team has been... Even if you don't agree with his points, he does make some very good videos and about the thought process trust behind them. Should have seen it coming. Now all the ADCs do tons of damage. I mean, he is a, he is an ADC <laughs> player, so definitely like I mean, he's had a big hand, I think, in, I mean, in the, the ADC is, item redesign. At least we can all be certain that Rumble Jungle won't get OP. <laughs> <laughs> all the old ones are the best ones. The ones the best. <laughs> Apparently, it was Riot Bright Moon was the name of the person. Yeah, there you go. Nah, well, but yeah, I, I do appreciate that there's a lot, at least a lot more communication and insight into some of the decision making behind the meta and what their goals are. So at least you can see if their goals are being successful. But um, I, I, I mean, I think Freak all, also doesn't like Yumi very much. And, you know, a, a big part of the motivation behind making the changes they did was they tried to make it so it wouldn't be viable in pro play. Unfortunately, that has failed. Um, it is more limited though, guys, it is more limited. At least what we've seen in, in LPL so far has not been a crazy number of Yumi bands. You just ban Zeri instead. That's been, right. that's been kind of the solution. I think we do a little five minute break. Then we do some questions, but we keep rich and he can answer some of the questions too. <laughs> if he wants to. You want to do that, Rich? You want to answer some yeah, real questions? Sure, yeah. yeah. We'll do a quick break then and we'll be back. Right, we're back to do some viewer questions. We're going to have Rich just stay with us here for this bonus episode of Not the the Three Horsemen, presented <laughs> by Summoning Insight Industries, now available on Reddit. Unless Travis Gafford fucking, miss, miss, but what's he doing though? What's he doing over there though? Like, shout out Travis Gafford, snitching one time. <laughs> one time now if you want to ask questions for this show you can't do it for this episode what you can do is you can subscribe to our discord the last Nation discord and there's a channel in there when you're subscribed where you can add the questions we're going to do some now and then we didn't have any last week so we had the monster episode and we'll do some next week as well and as usual they can be fairly yeah. out there and we try to answer them honestly yeah yeah so um we probably we're not going to do all of them this week Guys, we are very good at usually answering all of your questions, but obviously last week's show was four and a half hours long without the questions. 
and we're having so you get to choose. You can either have all your questions answered, or Rich, you know, we could have a guest answer some of your questions, not take up too much of their time, which they're already very generously providing. And I just don't um, want these lights on in my eyes anymore. I don't want all of the lights, mm. all of the lights, burning out my corneas and retinas. I'm, I'm ready to turn the lights down and chill for the night, boys. I've spent I don't, th I don't think uh, it's socially acceptable to reference that song anymore. Um, so <laughs> that shit can't tell me just, nothing. Just, <laughs> just a joke. Just a joke. Uh, in honor of Reginald looking to uproot his entire life and move east to pursue Peter Zhang, <laughs> what is your favorite revenge is sweet moment in esports? I mean, there's some pretty good ones. I mean, <laughs> like the, one the, the one, like, I will say, I know it's self indulgent, but I think it needs to be near the top of the list. I do think, because I've got a couple of these, I do think the one where I said repeatedly, the reason why we can't prove that this conflict of interest could turn out bad for TSM and Double Lift and Leader is because they basically have to just like record themselves seeing the stuff behind the scenes. They then put on a stream and recorded themselves seeing the stuff behind the scenes. Almost <laughs> like at that point, I actually, I actually started to think in that moment that my mind does actually like affect reality and that I'd built <laughs> such a level of insane like consciousness that I overpowered everything everyone else's collective unconscious and made that happen. That was pretty yeah. good. I'll give you another good one. There was the one where ESL tried to imply I was a xenophobe, a sexist, a racist, and a bigot of all stripes to the extent I could never be hired again. And then, oh, what's that? About two months and three, two years and three months later, they hired me again while explaining in the post hiring me that I am impossible to ignore. That's pretty good. That's <laughs> that's up there. That's near the top of the list. That was that was a satisfying day. I'll give you that one. <laughs> oh, got, man. You, I, you must have a good one. Rich. I, I agree what, with what you, you about the, the, the stream leaks from Double Lift and Lena. That was like a movie. It was like fucking waking up to being in a movie. It was crazy. Too good. I couldn't believe it really happened. I couldn't believe it was real life. Do you have one, Rich? You must have got revenge. Yeah, on I, it's fucking before. loads. But I, I, the thing is, it's like, how do, I don't know if I differentiate between like revenge and karma because they're more like karma based. Because basically, pretty much everyone who's ever like super aggressively come after me has within a relatively short period of time, reputation has just fallen into the fucking freezer. One being Ryan Morrison. Ever since this guy came out for ages saying that H2K was like mafioso and blah, 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 made up loads of lies about how Freeze had like broken his wrist playing for H2K, even though, of course, the trump card on that was Freeze having tweets up from a year before complaining that his wrist was fucked from being in North America. Whatever. That guy, uh, for those who don't know, he got embroiled in some nice little Me Too stuff, didn't he? Obviously, Reginald, another classic, someone who basically tried to drag my name through the mud in the uh, sort of early days of H2K being in the LCS. The whole whole story was basically predicated on the idea that I must be lying and he wasn't. And then everything he's done since has basically shown that he is, if anything, probably a compulsive liar. So that's pretty sweet every time that guy chooses to open his mouth. Uh, what else? Obviously, lots of people who have done... Uh, you do find, like, whenever you come across someone who's, like, truly, like, a despicable little weasel, that they do end up just outing themselves at some point. Broken Shard never did anything to me particularly, but I always thought, just wait, just wait. The time is ticking Quite on that one. Them, like a the lot of yeah, the bomb's gonna go off. Uh, maybe Monty will slightly disagree with this one, but I had similar vibes about Alicus. That guy kind of just disappeared after a few little behind-the-scenes yeah, things there. that, uh... Yeah. He's uh, just another clock chasing goblin. By yeah, the way, just... this is how many revenges I've had that have been awesome. I didn't even initially think of the one and a half hour video I did about Frankie, where I like scientifically prove she's a piece of shit. Mm. <laughs> that's pretty good because if you don't that's know science. she's can't argue with science she's guys. like double lift the biggest mistake she has is you just let her keep talking and she gives the whole game away so I had to like literally on record over and over and over tweet blog comment on this blog. So it was like that would have been the greatest trial of all time I would have just like won the shit like a fucking movie I'm Billy McBride motherfucker oh there's there's two more names I'll just throw in quickly one has yet to pass but will very soon I think the first name is Marty. Marty from Splice, another classic. This Let's guy, by the way, he was in every... So for those that don't know, and this is... By the way, someone from Riot tweeted at me yesterday under a comment that I'd made about Carlos, which had like nothing to do with esports. And he basically said, like, Carlos was great to work with and Rich was a complete nightmare to work with. But I do have to say that Carlos has some weird... Or something like this. And I was just thinking... 
what he actually means is basically every single person in the owner's room other than me was just rolling over for riot and i was just constantly complaining and asking for things which i thought were like fully justified and no one else would support me and marty was the ring not the ringleader that gives him way too much credit he was one of the biggest weasels when it came to just yes manning riot and saying oh what yeah we don't need digital uh items to be sold we don't need rev share we'll do whatever you want just please let us into franchising please let us into franchising like undermining us trying to actually do positive change at every fucking turn. And then obviously this guy got fired from overactive media, didn't he? So he's gone. And the one that's probably going to come to pass, if, you know, the LCS continues on its trajectory, is of course everyone's favourite real journalist, Travis Gafford. Because this guy has had ample opportunity to sort of expand users' platform and, you know, bridge out into other games, maybe at least other fucking regions, hasn't done it, has basically put all his fucking eggs in the LCS basket. And... That's going to come home to roost, I think, eventually, because LCS, who knows, could be no more. And then what's he going to do? You can't interview Double Lift at home and be like, what's home life with Lena like? That's only going to go on for so long, isn't it? So, yeah, nice little list of uh, karmatic catharsism. <laughs> there you go. Uh, what is your favorite 90s sci-fi film? Ooh. Ooh. I like this one. What what mm. are some good ones? Fifth Element, one of my favorites. Terminator Two. Ooh, it's a good one. Aliens. Uh, oh no, that's in the eighties yep. actually. Aliens in the eighties, I think. Mm, uh, was the sequel in the eighties? I think it was. Well, you like Dark City, don't you? Sorry, oh, it was eighty six. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dark City's pretty good, but you have to watch the director's cut for that one. Mm. I mean, I've already mentioned one that's a mad sleeper that no one's ever seen. It was actually written by James Cameron. There's one called Strange Days where they have sort of a device that can record your experience and you can play it back in sort of like a headset. That's a pretty out there one. It's pretty up there. I'd say Terminator 2 is probably the best for me. Yeah, it's can't really go wrong with that one, can you? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's a lot more like, like 12 Monkeys is a classic. People know that's that a great one. one. Uh, one of the more obscure ones, if you like The Matrix and Dark City, there's one called Thirteenth Floor. That's mega. It's mm -hmm. about the idea of like simulations. It's it's, a re it's one of the best tellings of that I've ever seen. What else is there from this? Gattaca. That's a classic. I I find that very inspirational um, personally. Uh, Cube, sci-fi horror movie. Is all right. What else? Uh, Gattaca. There? Oh, Gattaca is one of my probably all-time favorite movies. That was '90s. We sure not early 2000s for that one. No, that was nineties. That was nineties. Yeah, I know most of the years. Uh, it depends how far we're going with the concept uh, Starship of Starship sci Troopers. Starship Troopers, one of the greatest misunderstood <laughs> films of all time, because people thought it wasn't a satire for some reason, but it is really? a fucking dude. No way. People, when it was released, it was fucking shit. On most people to this day people. don't know it's a satire. They think it's just real. The joke is people wow. talking at face value, like, "Lol, this is hilarious!" Like, it's an excellent satire movie. Technically, though. it's yeah. right on the it's right on the line. It's 1990, but I've got to say, Total Recall. It's obviously a fucking sure. banger and half right there. Watch that now. Just cue it up. <laughs> don't watch the remake. Do not watch. No, nah, just remake. watch that one. Banger. Oh, Matrix, yeah, obviously, um, 1999. Oh, Matrix, oh, 99. Matrix. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was actually having this conversation with my wife the other day. It is fucking insane. The cultural capital of the matrix, like people were, were you're here 25 later, 25 years later. And if you haven't seen the matrix, you don't understand like a, so many pop culture references. It's so like deeply ingrained in society, even talking about reality as being the matrix. Like, I'm I don't even understand how you that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't even understand how you would function in, like, modern discourse if you hadn't seen The Matrix. Like, mm -hmm. it, just the effect that movie had on society, modern society, is unreal. I'm unreal. Doing Probably. I'm doing it yeah. half tongue-in-cheek, but half guilty pleasure. Don't give a fuck. 1997's Face Off by John Woo. Oh, I love God. Face it's Off. I fucking off. love Face Off. Is that, that really a sci-fi movie. movie, though? It's about taking people's faces off. do that in real life. <laughs> the fuck? Right, oh, look. But it's set, in, it's set in the modern day. <laughs> Boots with like, I'm Cash to Troy. Like, I do fucking, I do love that movie. Also, I just love how Nicolas Cage and John Travolta are just clearly having so much fucking fun awesome. in that movie. And it's Chewed so stupid. Exactly. It's so stupid. Chewed I love up the it. set. It's the shit. There's, it's a guilty pleasure, but it's a banger. It's, a banger. it's so good. I, I, I do love that movie. Um, Along uh, along those or lines. That thing, and by the way, look this up. This will give you so much joy. If you've seen the movie Face Off, there's a skit on Opie and Anthony that 
Patrice O'Neill did, where he explains why it's the dumbest movie ever. And he's right. And you'll be crying laughing because in the movie, they have to design some sort of a concept, the conceit in the plot, Monty, so that even though they have no idea this technology exists, but so that John Travolta's character's wife would know it was actually him, even if he looked like someone else. Already a ridiculous conceit. So what they make it is that they have sort of like a little pet thing that they do as lovers, but it's hilarious. What he does for real is he just takes his hand and puts it over her whole face like and that's like their move so that when he's like the other person he does that and it shows that that's secretly him it's so <laughs> ridiculous like that's your move like hey baby it's so just listen to this clip you'll be crying <laughs> off it's so good mate it's so good um a, so a good. couple others um i will i will say that uh Here's a here's a hot take for people who like Star Trek. Uh Star Trek First Contact I think is the best Star Trek movie. Um and that was 96. So, I love that movie. Also, uh let me just double check this. Galaxy Quest is one of my favorite movies of all time, which is actually better than any any Star Trek movie and is basically one of I think this is a, another hot take. One of the most perfectly crafted films that has ever been made in terms of accomplishing its goals, having virtually perfect pacing, nailing the satirical elements, excellent cast, fucking one of my all time favorite movies. Um, so I've got a banger for you, actually. Technically, this would only be 90s in certain countries, according to Wikipedia. I had to check because I thought, oh, it's got to be borderline. Being John Malkovich came out in 1999. Yeah. So there you go. Good movie. Yeah. I'm a huge Charlie Kaufman fan. So, yeah, that's. That's Basically, great. that's like a movie about double lift. Like either Kelby or Travis or Lena go into that thing and enter his head, and then they pop him around. And then he wakes up like, what, what happened? I, I did what on stream? But I did have breakfast yesterday. Anyway, go ahead. Next question. <laughs> um. Okay, so we have... Uh, next question is similar. Did Did you guys watch Firefly by Joss Whedon? If so, any opinions on the show? I have lots of opinions. <laughs> I, luckily, there's another one I was so far ahead of. I could already tell by what an utter smarmy twat all the characters he writes in his shows from Buffy onwards are, that I always actually despised Joss Whedon and thought he was a fucking hack, which now has turned out to be incredible and has just aged so well. Buffy was good early on, but like I always thought that guy was crap, so I never really dug that show. It was just all right. I thought, I thought the cult following was just a bit weird to me. I don't know what they did, why everyone was so into it. It's just all right. I uh, after I ran out of the expanse, I was told like TV shows uh -oh. you may like, uh, <laughs> and that was on there. Gosh. And can confirm, uh, no, not for me. I feel uh, like it's gonna be Monty's alley. I can tell. Come on, nope. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, obviously, as somebody who likes sci fi and who likes westerns, you would think that this would be you know, right yeah. up my alley, like Thorin says. So I enjoyed the show for what it was. So I think that, so here, here's the main issue. It was great that this show was canceled. It was excellent. You guys, you think you want like 10 seasons of Firefly? It would have fucking sucked, okay? It was good because it was a limited run where you got to see and enjoy the characters and it was kind of like a wacky space western that, you know, had some quips and had some, I, admittedly, like pretty memorable, memorable characters. And there were certain things that I really liked, such as I liked the Reavers. I thought that was a super cool concept of like space cannibals that had gone crazy and like the emptiness of space. I liked a lot of the language that they had, which felt like a Western. Um, but at the end of the day, we saw what the future of that show was because we got the movie and the movie was terrible in the same way that they ruined basically the force by having it be the whatever the little cells Bitty in your Orient. blood. Yeah, the midichlorians, it was so fucking stupid and killed all the mystery. The same way they were like, oh, the Reavers aren't crazy people in space. It was just a disease the whole time. And the whole point of the Reavers was the mystique. Like what made them scary was that you didn't understand them, right? The fear was based in the unknown and the mystery of the force was based in the unknown. So clearly like people over explain things in TV shows all the time that just don't need to be explained or movies. But the end result, like we saw what they they were moving towards by having that movie and the end sucked. So basically 
wish we had just gotten, I enjoy the show for what it was. Do I think it's an all-time great show? Absolutely not. It was kind of light and fluffy and didn't have a lot of weight or, I think, social commentary. And by the way, guys, ultimately, the, the point of good science fiction is always like modern social commentary. The whole point of sci-fi is you can spin things in a way where because you make it an abstract situation in the future, you can look at current events through a new lens. It is a tool for observing our reality in a different way. And Firefly was absolute shit at that. So it's not even really good sci-fi in my opinion, especially compared to shows like Battlestar Galactica, which were really good at doing that. Um, so it's fun. I enjoyed it somewhat. It is way over. People just, people think that it was going to be good forever. It wasn't. We know it wasn't. We have the evidence. So glad it got canceled is the end of it. Um, so anyway, uh, let's go on to the next one. Flash was a god in Brood War, but became a meme in SC2, an objectively easier game. When Flash went back to Brood War years later, he became a god again. Why do you think this happened? I mean, you just explained it. Yeah. If it's an easier game, <laughs> you would be able to less express yeah. all of your skill and have an edge over your opponents. It's why when they change rule sets in sports, offense becomes incredibly easy. Like, the point is it was harder because it took more skill to accomplish it. I also think as well that because you have people who immediately... I mean, it's like with anything. If you've got something that's been around for a really long time and people are honing on that and something new comes out and people other people immediately gravitate towards that while you're still doing the other thing and then you transition mm -hmm. like i mean i think i feel like he answered both parts of the quest if, if, yeah, if <laughs> yeah I, I agree <laughs> he just wanted us to put it together like, i've got two and i've got two but what's what is it equal <laughs> well four <laughs> holy shit that's why i tune into this show nice i'll also just say uh, as well that's just pretty common among games like if you don't know neo was the best 1.6 player and he was just in like a, an average tier one pro in csgo and had to play supportive roles and wasn't even a star player so i think just if you when when games switch i don't think people realize how specialized being good at one video game is yeah like, there are very rare people like fatality and wombat and some of these fuckers who can just go between many games but like typically one thing that makes you absurdly good it's like specifically the mechanics of that this it's so rare that you can actually transition between games anyway no matter who you are agreed um now that the holy war has been won will there be a long period of peace or will we crusade onwards is it time to declare all out war upon the eg org next we have discussed the eg holy war <laughs> we're getting there i mean it kind of already has happened in a way yeah they weren't they didn't put up much of a fight though really did they eg it kind of uh <laughs> You know, at least with Reggie, you've got all these kind of passive aggressive things that you'd hear about through like back channels. It feels like EG just kind of lied a bunch and then got exposed and no one's really Miz, fighting though, their corner. What, and what nobody got it? punished. Great. What was the cost though, Rich? That's the problem. Here's the problem. EG, as long as they were willing to take a bit of bad PR, won. They won that war. We actually lost that one. Here's why. Because what happened was... Magically, remember, I had my video, but it's really about Richard's reporting, where it's on paper and all the things you've done and said. That's the final word in esports and what you did wrong. But the final message of Evil Genius Danny's story was a guy who's not even a journalist and has no qualifications and is a shithead who doesn't even know how to cross-reference facts, said he himself had a source within Danny's family or circle. Mm. And essentially, through those people who'd been paid off via him getting the streaming contract and no longer wanted to pursue it because they'd gotten their payoff. These are people who had this guy playing League of Legends at six years old, guys. These people magically engineered it. So what do you know? The main theme we all had to take, casters, journalists, people on the broadcast, people who are fake journalists was, it wasn't about anyone EEG. We shouldn't call any of them out by name. It was just a systemic problem. Therefore, it's just a problem of the esports industry. Sad it happened to Danny, but oh well, he said he's okay with it anyway. So in some way, is rich they did win like it's a bit like astralis i'll never claim i beat astralis i never did what i did was to people who really care i showed their pieces of shit i can't actually beat astralis they made out like bandits they wrecked flashpoint they sold the players they got what they needed they won majors like that I, I can't actually physically beat them
The thing is, though, I feel like with TSM, they were sort of a very successful company, like throughout like the Crusade, where you get like a more. It always felt, you know, bigger and more satisfying. Where EG is just built on quicksand, right? Like, e, I mean, with, and the LCS itself is built on quicksand. Obviously, that's not their only endeavor, but we've seen what they've been doing in Counter Strike and so on. Like that entire organization is kind of on quicksand. So even though like you may not have won by virtue of whatever, like checkmating them individually, like. I mean, they've they've checkmated themselves, really, haven't they? I mean, that ways, that company's yeah. not going anywhere. I would be amazed if EG, what, it, barring being bought out by Saudis or something, I I would be amazed if EG existed in five years. I genuinely would. I don't think they will. I don't think they'll be. But the way, it, there's another video coming on that topic. Don't worry. CS score related, but <laughs> that's all I'll tell you. There's something good coming on the pipe. It's all good. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know if Rich is an NFL fan, but do you think Jalen Hurts oh, is a t- Oh, good. Uh, Top tier QB, or is he a good slash average QB being propped up like a Danny or a Yike? Uh, (laughs) I mean, I think he had a very good season, but also we can't discount the fact that Jalen Hurts had arguably the best offensive line in the NFL and also A.J. Brown fucking popped the fuck off like nobody would have guessed. And he had an excellent wide receiver room and he also had some good tight ends as well. So the there were a lot of options for him. But I think I, I mean, he had a great season. Is he a new superstar quarterback. I think there's too little evidence and he's been doing it with what I would consider an excellent supporting cast. So I think jury's still out on that one. I think the problem is like, I don't get the Danny comparison. I don't see how I, the, the, the Ike, you know, jungler more of a sort of quarterbackish role, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think he's good. I think people who I'm always worried about quarterbacks that rely at least a modicum on their athleticism as well. I think that can, uh, like doesn't necessarily always, uh, indicative of long successful careers. I mean, sure. he's clearly not in like the Rogers Mahomes, uh, in a very different way. Brady, like kind of caliber. I, I don't, I don't see that at all. Even like, would you put like, if you're picking, if you're drafting, do you take him above Josh Allen? Mm. No, no, probably I w- not. I wouldn't personally. Do you take him above? Um, oh God, uh, Justin Herbert? Probably not. Mm, I think those kind of players are more immune to the supporting cast that they have. And the other thing about the Eagles is you have to remember that a lot of their success up until the Super Bowl was based off of their pass rush and their defense. So, yeah, I don't know. I think I think that's a that's a hard call. I do think he's very good, um, yeah. but I don't know if he's like gonna be you know, Hall of Fame status. Let's put it that way. The problem I have is this. I think I've seen this before. He was called Lamar Jackson. It's the same <laughs> thing. What happens is, it's like, wow, they can throw it a bit. And also, they're amazing with their legs. But as Rich says, like, spoiler, when you run like that. Now, luckily, the NFL rules are so fucked. People who are players in the moment forget that once you run as the quarterback, you are now a runner and you can tackle him like you would a running back. But they don't do it. They don't do it. Even Patrick Mahomes has done this to score pa- touchdowns in the playoffs. So because people don't enforce that, at the moment, you can do it, right? Spoiler, the reason why a rushing quarterback would be terrible in the old rules is it's like being a running back. You just get banged up all day long and you'd be injured and you'd, you wouldn't have a career. So as long as you're allowed this like OP thing of being able to rush and throw sometimes, like when those players have the right team around them, obviously they're OP because you can't tackle them. They just rush in touchdowns. So I did think he had a phenomenal season, but it does remind me of the MVP season of Lamar Jackson. Mm. Too. It was a similar thing. And so you also see when you then don't have the pieces or you don't have a good all line like Monty says, that also goes away. Like at the end of the day, there's a reason why in the modern day teams don't just build around a running back. Oh, also, yeah, I mean, a, oh, sorry, I was going to say just the last thing. The Ravens were very hesitant to pay Lamar Jackson, which seems crazy mm-hmm. at a glance, but I think that's, that's why. Rival. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Lamar Jackson. I, I really enjoy Lamar Jackson as a player, and I think that the the main issue with him is that his wide receivers have been fucking bums for for the last couple of years. I mean. It's been rough for the Ravens. Um, but yeah, I mean, they. I think you are reluctant to offer a bunch of guarantees to quarterbacks that have a higher chance of injury due to, to running and due to the style of play that they have. But I think that Lamar Jackson is kind of like reverse Jalen Hurts, where Jalen Hurts had all of the support. Lamar Jackson has been, has been like, you know, soloing his team for a while now. I mean, his um, even even his running backs were very ball. injured. That's so. the problem. They spent the money in the wrong place. Yeah. Um... Okay, next, we'll do a couple more questions, guys. Considering the LPL playoffs will probably be more competitive 
tournament than Worlds again? Have you guys thought about doing an LFN show covering the best region in the world? I just don't think there are enough people who would watch it. Because well, LPL is the lowest English viewership. viewership. You know, if you had like some big name, yeah. might, well, I agree. It's just a general show. It's an example of just like Academy where people say they want something, but their actions don't prove it. And also we cover uh, LPL very, we cover it a lot, both on SI and Power Spike. So, I mean, I don't know if there's, we need an entire spinoff show about it. It's also a huge investment. Like if you're unsure about whether you'd want to do it based on those reasons, like you have to invest more time in that than anything else, like when given all things are equal, yeah. just because of how many games, the volume of games. So it is a yeah. big investment. Yeah, I think I think we cover it enough, especially on Power Spike with Dom. So I'm I'm not super about that, but maybe in the future. Uh the new LCK rules regarding player salary slash agents is going to be implemented immediately. Is there anything the players can do to fight these changes being implemented? And would they be willing to actually fight these changes? Many of these changes regarding salary restrictions would not be able to be implemented legally in the US without a formal collective bargaining agreement and players union. Yes, this, this is all true. This LCK is what I have said. Was it yeah, LCK? for LCK. Right, okay. I mean, it's I've complained about this on this There's show. It's why I said stop comparing LCS to LCK and LPL. It's a different world with a different government that runs in a different way and has different expectations of what the government and rulers can do to you. Yeah, and they are aligning themselves, as I understand it. Now, I do not, to be clear, have an excellent comprehension of the Korean legal system. It goes without saying, right? Like, I, I, I'm not fluent in Korean, and I'm especially not fluent in fucking legal Korean. You know what I mean? So... I'm probably not the right person to ask specifically about those aspects of Korean legality over those contracts. But as I understand, it's very similar to the way they operate professional sports leagues in Korea, which would be illegal in the United States because basically they're implementing salary caps and salary restrictions without actually having a union to bargain against them, which is antitrust in the U.S. But as Thorin said earlier on this show, Korean companies are the way Korean operates is there are very few antitrust laws, which is why Samsung is responsible for like a quarter of the entire Korean economy. And it's basically just like these corporate, you know, mega companies in Korea that own absolutely everything. Um, so it's a different system of governance. It's a different economy. Korea is basically like the end goal of capitalism. Um, that's why if you watch or movies or read books like Cloud Atlas, it's kind of like projecting Korea in the future even more capitalistic than it already is. Um, but effectively, I, I mean, I'm not a fan of them, but at the same time, I also, as we've talked about extensively on the show, sympathize with the LCK teams and would like the LCK to be able to continue and player salaries are out of control there. So, um, I do think it's very punishing, especially on rookies, which I don't like, um, but something must be done. I have revised my opinion <laughs> based on current economics. Any, any thoughts? Anybody else? Are we moving? <laughs> I mean, oh, I'm, really? I'm like, I'm, yeah. I think salary caps is something that can only you can only give an opinion on when you have complete full context of the situation. Because again, it's like comes back to this whole thing of even with what we've been talking about today with um, that situation and people blaming franchising for some of the shortcomings and so on. It's like no bullshit. Like franchise, we've seen what franchising looks when it's done really well, and it is the best financial economic format you can have for players for the organization itself and for the teams just objectively like we have objective proof of that but in esports guess what we didn't get it right did we like it's shock that doesn't mean that franchising as a concept is bad so i think the same is true of salary caps right because to use that same analogy like they have salary caps in franchise leagues and these people are not bleeding for money you know like they are incredibly well compensated i think player for player nba is probably the most uh lucrative uh sports in the world when it comes to how much the players are played on average so i think salary caps do not have to be like an evil thing right like i think they can be a really good thing given the certain um certain yeah. criteria so yeah it, it's like impossible to make cross regional comparisons when it comes to the lck i don't know enough about korea to really comment but i would say it's not a, like a taboo word. It's like it could be executed well, I suppose. Is it going to hurt people say, like Baker? Probably. I'll just say what I said on the episode of The Four Horsemen. 
I can't handle people whose principles just do not exist. So on the one hand, players can get as much money and salary as they want. They're entitled to it, apparently, and should aggressively argue in their own self-interest, as Philip Aram said. But apparently team orgs who've put billion, hundreds of millions of dollars in, they're not allowed to just make loads of money. Like, I don't know what we're fucking doing at this point in time. It's just fucking mean girls. And I, I'm more interested in the industry angle. So I actually like the idea of the salary cap in the sense that, like, it actually provides, like, fucking some level of parity some level of skill. I actually don't like it in a purest sense because I actually just like the idea if you have the money, spend it and buy the players. If you're the best team, get in the league. I, I, I would have the most open system ever. Well, that's why I like kind of the soft cap system that the LPL has or the NBA has because it allows you to spend more money as long as you pay the luxury tax. Kind yeah, of a still good does fuck the player. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe. By definition, like Kobe Bryant would have been on $100 million a year, mate. He made $30 million yeah. at the end of his career. So it does. This fucking rookie contract fucks the player. The problem is this. You, everyone can't have their cake and eat it. So what you have to ask yourself is, what do you want? Do you want players to make the most money? Then you're going to get, like European football, incredible inequality and the same four or five names winning over and over again. And when they don't win, they'll just buy the best players and win again next time. That's what you get. So the question you have to ask for, like we always say, Monty, is what are you selecting for? What is your yeah. end goal? If it's to have loads of great matches and everyone to have a region where every single team can have a star player, it's what they tried to do with the NBA and the NFL, then you have to go to a cap system and a draft system and rookie contracts that's how you get that unfortunately but someone will lose out someone always loses out in this scenario uh all right we'll do one more question guys again sorry we're not going to get to all of them this week um lots to talk about though when it came to everything else so let's do uh the next one is as of today what order one through three do you have the following players three players ranked in history Trovi, Knight, and Showmaker. So picking among three mids, uh, how would we rank these players in terms of accomplishments? Accomplishments? Wow. Or, or I mean, we can rank them on whatever criteria we want. We have to rank them one through three. All right. You can go first, Rich. Ooh, uh, so Trovi, Knight, and Showmaker. Uh, oh, God. Okay, my criteria is just best, I guess. Uh, I'll say... I'll say Knight, Showmaker, Chovy. The reason why I'm putting Chovy last is because I... he. I guess it's slightly true for Showmaker. I, there have been periods... So there's never been a period, like a chunk of time where I've been like, Knight's just not doing night <laughs> things like that's true it hasn't existed like that period hasn't existed so he kind of wins by default because he also has a comparable ceiling it, some could argue even a better ceiling maybe but um so yeah he wins by default both showmaker and chovy do fall into the category and i would say particularly chovy where it's like ah oh, chovy just doesn't seem like chovy at the moment and when you're dealing with three players who are very comparable in my opinion when it comes to like their peaks and their sort of highest tier of play it's kind of addition by subtraction when making the list in that sense. Like, I feel like Chovy's the guy who has had the most barren periods of looking like an absolute, you are the best or second best, whatever, mid in the world. So that would be my order. Right, where are you going, Monty? I would say my order is Showmaker, Knight, Chovy. Um, even though I think Chovy has the highest ceiling, it's that every time we've seen him kind of attend an international event, he has, as Rich says, not looked like himself. And it took him a significant amount of time to reach the point where he could win a domestic title. And I love domestic Chovy these days, but international Chovy, you know, frequently, I mean, especially at Worlds last year, I think he played really badly compared to his normal level that and the evolution we had seen him uh, as a player, he seems to get nervous when he plays at these big international events. It just regresses, which I find very disappointing for me. Showmaker is probably number one, just because the, the kind of run they went on where they were one world second at MSI second at worlds, you know, one game shy of, of winning worlds in 2021, that level of consistency, both domestically and in international performances was really, I think exceptional. Uh, over that period, they also won three straight titles uh, domestically within the LCK. And Knight has 
unfortunately not even gotten that many shots at an international event and also but jdg looks fucking amazing right now obviously part of a super team and finally winning an inter, you know the big international title at msi so i think knight is well on the way i think jdg probably should be the favorite for worlds as it stands right now for the world championship and if he can complete that i would agree that his consistency has been exceptional, um, especially because Showmaker has been struggling recently and Chovy hasn't had the international success. So Knight could be number one out of these by the end of the year. Right, this is going to be, I'm going to basically say the same order as Rich, but for slightly different reasons. So it's going to be edgy because I'm not putting Showmaker number one. So here's why. Because Knight, if I'm just looking at the body of work, every game they played at the LPL level and above. Now, true, what Knight doesn't have is the same number of international performances. He had the MSI now, but aside from that, he didn't have the same performances Showmaker did internationally, right? But international is actually a very small amount of games. It's not that many series even. Yeah. So the problem is, if I'm looking at body of work, first of all, you play loads of games in the LPL, and Knight, unironically, for like three or four years now, to me, looked like the best player in the world. He was unbelievable. Didn't matter who his teammates were, didn't matter if he was inted by his jungle in his top lane. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that. Everyone loves to tell me. I remember when Reckless and Hillersang was shitting on Jackie Love. Why did you never mention the other guy in the lane? Why did you never mention Yu Yanjia? One, you don't even remember his name. And two, he was a massive fucking weakness on that team. Spoiler, that's why they were losing to a Western bot lane. So to me, Knight is just unbelievable. If I turn the name plates off, it's like Aaron Rodgers. How can I say anyone else is better than him at the position? It's just fucking impossible what he did. Now, the obvious one knock is the international angle, but that's where Showmaker has the big edge. He's the one with the international runs. But my problem is this. I'll just say one name immediately, Canyon. Right, you go and look. You know Canyon's won the MVP a bunch of times in the LCK. You know Canyon is the one that people say now is the greatest jungler in the history of Korean League of Legends or League of Legends in general. He played the whole time with Showmaker. It was a duo and Jungle Mid has always been the most OP duo in League of Legends historically because mid lane is OP. Then, beyond even just Canyon, by the way, where's Canyon for fucking Knight? Where's Canyon for Chovy? I guess Tar he had early Tarzan did Chovy, but that's, a that's only for a year or two. Then... As well as Canyon, he had Nagori at his prime, amazing top laner. And then he also just rocked up with fucking Khan for a year. And Khan was also a really good player. That's the reason why he's been a champion many times over in many different teams. So I think Showmaker just had the ultimate help. It was like the example we gave before. He's had the Jalen Hurt setup of everything you could want, minus basically a hard carry ADC. And he plays in LCK where you don't need a hard carry ADC to win or to win worlds. They're a fucking top lane region. So to me, Showmaker was very, very good. But I also feel like, I feel like he got everything out of his career. I don't have any what ifs about Showmaker. Then lastly, the reason Chauvy's last is really brutal because Chauvy, like theoretically could have been the best of them all. He actually at times even looked like he'd figured things out about laning and how to fucking play. He looked like he was a genius, but the problem is he is easily the most idiosyncratic of the three. He's the one that looks like he himself capped himself in some of his games. He didn't always have the best teammates on DRX and fucking HLE. Yeah, that's true. But even so, he, he sometimes looked like he was one of those players you get in like American football in fucking basketball where they're like, essentially he's like Carmelo Anthony. He's amazing individually, offensively, but he's not that great a team player. And unfortunately it's a team game and you've got to have a bit of team components. You've got to have a teammate you work with. So to me, Chovy has to be last. I could change up Knight and Showmaker depending on what criteria I'm going for. If we're going on accomplishments, by the way, Showmaker wins this at a canter, an absolute canter. He has a way better resume. I think, by the way, on the Knight versus Showmaker thing, for example, I mean, you kind of already hinted on it anyway, Thorin, but the sheer volume of games and series that Knight has played at what I would call a world's level, but just technically in LPL is ridiculous. Like if you look at the number, let's just call them, let's just say they're called elite series, right? And you put out all the elite series games, like best of fives, best of threes, or whatever that they played. I don't think the gap is that huge. Showmaker's just done it internationally. And obviously because of the format's different or whatever, you know, it, it looks different on paper. If you put the world's template, uh, the nameplate, sorry, and the LPL nameplate, but the amount of series and gauntlets that Knight's teams have had to go through in LPL and the amount of series that he's played is insane. And I can't think, I mean, I'm sure there is one or two, but I can't think of a specific series in my head where I'm like, God, Knight really didn't show up. It feels like he always does. And I feel like Showmaker is successful and as amazing his career has been. He has had moments where he hasn't been himself. Not as much as Chovy, which is why I put Chovy last, but... I think that Knight is like hyper consistent. Even people like Faker have had like massive down years, right? Where they've sure. just not been anywhere near themselves. But for Knight's whole career, I feel like he's been Knight. And by the way, I'll just throw this out there. I implied it with the Canyon one. 
If he was the best player on the best team in the LCK for two or three years, where's all the MVPs for me? Where's all the MVPs, Shawmaker? Where are they, mate? By the way, small, there's a, that clip you guys probably saw, I think it was a couple of years ago, where Showmaker played at Worlds, uh, and it's like, here's Pov, it's like a pro view Pov of him against Humanoid in lane, it's uh, Syndra into Oriana, and it's like, people were shipping this clip all over the place, because it's like, perfect fucking trading and wave management or whatever. But what was really interesting for me is, it has his cam on as well. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing for him. I'm saying this is like how good his team is. He never looks at his fucking minimap. The whole time he's laning, he is just laser focused on the lane and CSing and trying to get damage off. Humanoid is probably like, where the fuck is it? Like, where? Like, what's my team doing? Like, they're, they're probably all getting their shit shoved in. They're probably it's losing every lane. He played the whole game from the minimap. He was like, that's why it's hard <laughs> to land the skill shots. You know, there's a joke, whatever. Yeah, like, so I, I think that um, there's something to be said. Like, when you have that, le like, Hall of Fame level players in lots of different positions and you trust your teammates, especially, you know, as Thorin said, like mid jungle, you do have less pressure on you. Playing mid lane when you don't trust your jungler is fucking hellscape, by the way. Like, that's just horrible. You can't lane, you can't focus. You're like, you're always wondering what this idiot's doing. So I do think that is worthy context. All right. Well, that's it for viewer questions this week. Thanks for sticking around, Rich, for that. Pleasure to have you to talk about all these issues. Hopefully, guys, we'll have uh, more games to talk about next week. It's been a bit meta during this offseason, but LCK is rolling this week. And uh, uh, Double F do maybe... something before then. Here's one thing I'll always give Double F credit for. He's hella entertaining. Unintentionally, yeah. but he's really entertaining. <laughs> isn't he? And and also, whenever the dust settles on this whole L LCS PA versus Riot versus the team issues, there will be another episode of the Four Horsemen, obviously, to like analyze what the results of this is, are are going to be and and see kind of where everything fell. So you can look forward to that as well. We'll see you next week.